Molly Bish, a 16-year-old lifeguard from Warren, Massachusetts, disappeared on June 27, 2000. She was dropped off at Coleman's Pond by her mother, Maggie, to begin her second week on the job. Later that day, her mother received a call that Molly had not been seen at work. Her belongings were found on the shore, but Molly was missing. A massive search ensued, but it wasn't until June 2003 that her remains were discovered by a hunter in a wooded area known as Whiskey Hill in Palmer, Massachusetts. The investigation into her disappearance and murder remains one of the largest and most expensive in Massachusetts history. Molly and Bish was born August 2nd of 1983. She was the youngest of Maggie and John Sr.'s three children. The Bish family was originally from Detroit, however, an incident in their old neighborhood pushed them to move. A woman was attacked walking back home from work and was later found murdered. This scared Maggie and John, who decided to relocate and find a safer place to raise their children. And just like that, the Bish family moved to Warren, Massachusetts. Life in Warren is quiet. It's a small town surrounded by nature, but a peaceful environment to raise children in, which is exactly what Maggie and John were looking for. John Jr., Heather, and Molly grew up to be very happy there, especially Molly. Since she was a child, Molly stood out from the crowd. She was kind and outgoing, and wasn't afraid to bring out her goofy and fun side. At school, she proved to be a great student. She had no trouble getting good grades and was heading to a bright future. But if there was something she especially loved, it was sports. Molly was very athletic and played both soccer and basketball in high school. And as someone who loved the outdoors, she would seek every opportunity she had to spend time among nature. That's probably why, in the summer of 2000, she inherited her brother's lifeguard job at the pond. For the past three years, John had been the lifeguard, so it was her brother who trained her and prepared her to take over. Molly was excited for this job. Not only would she get to spend time outside, but there were also activities for children planned in the pond where she'd be working. Molly had a passion for children. Her sister, Heather, had a baby at the time, and Molly loved her. Working with children was her dream, and after high school, she wanted to go to college and work in the field of education. So after learning from her brother and working hard to earn her certification, Molly started her job on June 19th of 2000, where she was going to spend the whole summer as a lifeguard at Commons Pond. Commons Pond is a small recreational area located in a central and residential part of Warren. During the summer, they offer swimming lessons for children, and it was a popular place for families to cool off from the heat. The pond is surrounded by an artificial beach, and that's where Molly's lifeguard post was located. Every morning, Maggie Bish would drive Molly to the pond. However, on June 27th, it would be the last day she would get to do that. On June 27, swimming lessons were due to begin at Commons Pond, and Molly was running late. Her mother drove her to work just in time, and she arrived at the parking lot at exactly 10 a.m. Mother and daughter said their goodbyes, and Molly hurried down to the beach to set up for the day. However, at 10.20 a.m., only 20 minutes after Molly had arrived, the first family got to the beach, only to find nobody was there. A mother saw the lifeguard post was set up. There was a towel, flip-flops, and even a backpack around the chair and bench. However, the teenage lifeguard was nowhere to be found. As the minutes went by and more parents arrived, the absence of a lifeguard became strange, especially since all her things were left at the post, so one of the parents eventually called the parks commissioner and reported their concerns. The parks commissioner quickly went to the beach and saw for himself that Molly wasn't there, and after a quick search of the surroundings, he called the police. At around 1 p.m., three hours after dropping her daughter off, Maggie got a call. It was the police, and they were saying that Molly was not at the pond, and she hadn't been all morning, although her things were still there. Maggie was shocked. She had dropped Molly off herself that morning. The family quickly went to the pond to try and figure out what was happening, but when they arrived, they found that the police weren't as anxious as them about Molly being gone. The initial thought was that Molly had left her job voluntarily, and was maybe just hanging out with her friends. 
They also suggested that she had perhaps run away from home, a popular assumption when teenagers go missing, which only frustrates the parents, who can sense when something doesn't add up, and in this case, none of these initial theories made sense. The family knew this wasn't a runaway. Not only were her shoes still there, along with all of her belongings, but Molly was responsible and hardworking. She wouldn't just take off and disappear, especially not without her shoes. Immediately they knew something had happened to her. So police took to another theory that she had drowned. Her brother John, who had trained her to take over his job as a lifeguard, thought this was very unlikely. His sister knew about safety, she was an excellent swimmer, and no witnesses had seen her drown. Although this happened around 10 a.m., the pond was soon filled with people, so someone would have seen or heard something. Regardless, the pond was searched for signs of Molly and a possible incident which could result in her drowning, but after a whole day of searching, no trace of Molly was found. It wasn't until the next day when police started treating this as a missing children's case, and the investigation took the course it should have had from the start. Molly hadn't drowned. She had disappeared. On June 28th, at 6 a.m., one of the largest search operations ever conducted in Massachusetts began in hopes to find Molly. There were helicopters using infrared cameras, mounted units, search dogs, and volunteers. Hundreds of people from the local and state police, as well as neighbors, looked for Molly tirelessly. However, she was nowhere to be found. Nothing at the scene suggested there had been any kind of foul play. Her towel was sitting on the back of her chair, her flip-flops were right in front of it, her water bottle was sitting beside her post, her backpack, containing two whistles, a first aid kit, and a two-way police radio, was undisturbed on the nearby bench she always left it on. Back in 2000, when the use of cell phones was still limited, Molly's contact with emergencies in case there was one at the pond was using a two-way radio she collected every morning on her way to work, and once she arrived and set up at the pond, she would report to the police at the start of her shift. Investigators retraced her steps leading up to the moment of her disappearance, but nothing stood out of the ordinary in her routine. That morning, on June 27, Maggie had driven Molly to work like she always did. They were running a little tight on time, since Molly was usually at the pond a little before 10 o'clock to set up. At 9.50 a.m., they stopped at a convenience store to buy water. At 9.56 she collected her radio from the station, and at 9.58 they pulled into the pond's parking lot. Maggie saw the lot was empty, only a truck delivering sand for the pond's beach was there. Mother and daughter said their goodbyes, and Molly rushed to the beach to set up for the first day of swimming lessons. However, that morning, Molly never reported the start of her shift to the police, and 20 minutes later, Parents began to arrive and eventually called the park's commissioner to report that the lifeguard was nowhere to be found. However, dismissing the theories of Molly running away or drowning, Maggie Bish told the police something that changed the course of the investigation. The day before Molly disappeared, June 26, Maggie had driven her daughter like she always did. When they pulled into the parking lot that morning, there was a man with a mustache smoking outside a white sedan. As soon as she saw him, Maggie was uncomfortable. He was watching Molly closely, in a way that made her nervous to leave her daughter there. Regardless, Molly had to work, so Maggie helped her set up her post at the beach. When she walked back to her car, leaving Molly behind, she saw the man was still there, sitting inside his car. She mentioned how she locked eyes with him, and he just stared back at her. Just to be safe, Maggie had waited until he pulled out of the parking lot before leaving herself. This incident from the day before the 16-year-old went missing seemed relevant, so police made a sketch of the man, which was the only clue that could potentially shine a light on what happened to Molly. Although Maggie hadn't seen the stranger on the day Molly vanished, the sketch proved to be somewhat helpful at the beginning. Another witness said he saw someone with a similar description at the pond's parking lot a few minutes before Molly arrived. A second witness also came forward with information about a white sedan with a similar description to the one Maggie gave, parked at a nearby cemetery. This cemetery is connected to the pond by a path, so it's very likely that if someone had taken Molly, they had access to this path so as not to be seen in the parking lot. 
Considering only 20 minutes went by from when Maggie dropped her off, and the first parents arrived at the pond, whatever happened to Molly happened fast. There were no screams or sounds of a fight heard, Molly's things were undisturbed, and no signs of foul play were evident at the scene. This means that if a stranger took her, they would have probably had a gun, another weapon, or some way to keep Molly quiet and get her into their vehicle in a matter of minutes. However, no signs of this man or anyone matching his description were found during the search for Molly. To this day, it's the largest and most expensive search for a missing person ever undertaken in Massachusetts, and the most frustrating one too. Molly was simply gone. In the spring of 2003, a hunter was making his way through the woods in Whiskey Hill, just a few miles away from the pond where Molly vanished from, when he came across what looked like part of a blue women's bathing suit. Molly Bish had been wearing a similar bathing suit the day she disappeared, so the discovery was reported to the police. The bathing suit was immediately sent to the lab for DNA testing, but Molly's parents already knew it was hers, her mother had bought it for her the summer she disappeared. When DNA confirmed the suit was indeed Molly's, the search began, only this time, they knew they were likely to find scattered remains. And they did. A skull, 26 bones, a lock of hair, and a tongue ring, all belonging to Molly, confirmed that the teenager had been killed. Although it was impossible to determine a cause of death with so little left of her, the main theory suggested she was murdered and buried somewhere in the woods. After years, animals had dug most of it out, and scattered it around a 500-foot area. The Bish family buried their daughter on what would have been her 20th birthday in August of 2003 in an emotional tribute to her life. But the events of June 27th were still a mystery. Over 20 years of investigation haven't been able to answer any questions of what really happened on the morning when Molly vanished. Hundreds of tips have come in over the years, none of which have resulted in substantial leads. The only lead for a suspect investigators had was a decades-old sketch of a man who potentially had something to do with Molly's disappearance, and attempts to identify that man have proven to be challenging. The first strong lead came in 2009 when a Florida man convicted of murdering his girlfriend was investigated as a suspect. Rodney Stanger had lived just a few miles away from Warren for over 20 years, and only a few months after Molly's disappearance, he moved to Florida. Rodney had murdered his girlfriend, Crystal Morrison, who he'd been with for over two decades. After seeing what he had been capable of, the victim's sister thought this may not be the first time he'd killed someone, and she alerted the Massachusetts authorities since Rodney had a white sedan at the time of Molly's disappearance. He'd also been fishing at Commons Pond and hunting in the area where Molly's body was found. When compared next to the sketch, police saw a resemblance and decided to investigate further. However, no evidence was found of his involvement, and he was never charged in the case of Molly Bish. Another lead came in 2011 when a man named Gerald Bodystoney was named a suspect. A private detective investigating the case had a reason to believe he was involved in Molly's death. Gerald had several charges of rape in the 80s and early 90s, and he'd been seen in the area where Molly's remains were found. He too resembled the sketch of the mysterious man in the white sedan, and when he found he was being named a suspect in the case, as well as another murder case in the area, he attempted to take his own life in prison, but failed to do so. DNA testing was conducted to find out if he was involved in Molly's case, but the results were inconclusive. Gerald Bodystoney died in November of 2014, and once again, the trail was cold. But in June of 2021, a new development brought hope to the case and the prospect of finally answering the question of who killed Molly Bish. Addicted sex offender Frank Sumner was named a suspect in the case. He was a person of interest, a suspect in her disappearance and murder. Sumner had a violent past that included kidnapping and raping a 21-year-old woman. The county district attorney announced on June 3, 2021, that thanks to the investigation still in process and the tip lines available for the public to come forward, there was a new person of interest in the case. Francis Sumner Sr. Francis was born in 1945, and between 1960 and 2016, he lived in Massachusetts, where he worked at several auto repair shops. 
the new potential suspect had an extensive criminal record dating back to the 80s. Many of his charges included rape and kidnapping, for which he was sentenced and would have been released in the late 90s. However, questioning the suspect was not possible. Francis Sumner was found dead in his home in 2016 and was never questioned on the disappearance and murder of Molly Bish. Despite his criminal history, Sumner's DNA was never entered into any criminal databases. Investigators hoping to solve Molly's murder are now working with DNA from his son, Frank Sumner Jr. Investigators are now asking the public to dig into their memories and try to find out more about Francis' habits, his whereabouts at the time, or any other information that could help confirm whether he had any involvement in the murder. The family of Francis Sumner quickly spoke out and demanded the DA provided them with any evidence of his involvement. However, since this is still an ongoing investigation, naming him a person of interest is a part of that investigation, and authorities have deemed it necessary to let the public know who is in their radar in order to bring closure to the family of Molly Bish. A year later, there have been no new developments and Francis Sumner's involvement is still just a theory. Molly Bish's family, who have been working endlessly to try and keep this case in the public eye, are anxious to learn what investigators have found and how close they really are to solving this 20-year-old mystery. From the moment their daughter disappeared, Maggie and John Bish felt they had to do something to prevent this tragedy from striking other families. So while they were still looking for their daughter, they set up the Molly Bish Foundation as a way to spread the knowledge and understanding of child and family safety and push laws that will protect minors from faulty police work. When Molly disappeared, authorities' first response was to dismiss it as a runaway. This sacrificed valuable time in searching for Molly. The goal of the foundation is to perfect training in children's missing persons cases and ensure the first response is always effective. Over the years, They've promoted training of first responders, they've established task forces to identify and change laws that may be outdated regarding missing people, and they've aided in legislations for the promotion of familial DNA searches as an extra step, when a DNA profile comes back with no hits. This technology would quickly narrow down the search for suspects, especially with the ever-growing DNA databases. The Bish family was struck by tragedy, but while they mourn their loss, they decided to become a voice of change, to protect other children and make sure nobody has to go through what they endured. Despite ongoing efforts and advances in forensic science, Molly Bish's case remains unsolved. Her family continues to advocate for child abduction awareness and maintains hope for justice. Claire Bernal was a 22-year-old beauty consultant working at Harvey Nichols in London. Her life tragically ended in September 2005 when she was murdered by her ex-boyfriend, Michael Pesh, a former security guard at the same store. Pesh shot Claire four times in the head in front of horrified shoppers before turning the gun on himself. Pesh and Bernal had dated briefly, but after their relationship ended, he began stalking her obsessively. Despite Claire reporting his behavior to the police, Pesh was released on bail. Just days before the murder, Pesh traveled to Slovakia to obtain a handgun, which he smuggled back into the UK. The case highlighted significant failures in the legal and protective systems, including allowing Pesh to travel while on bail and failing to prevent him from obtaining a weapon. The tragedy prompted calls for better measures to protect victims of stalking and harassment. Claire Marie Bernal was born on July 25, 1983, in Groombridge. Claire's mother, Patricia Adams, worked as a chef, and the, her father, Martin, was a finance manager who conducted business in London. Claire was the oldest of three children. When the girl turned seven, her parents divorced. She maintained close relationships with both of them. Claire was a quiet and calm. She attended a Catholic secondary school and worked part-time at a local store to be able to finance her love for cosmetics. When Claire turned 18. By that time, she was a self-taught makeup artist, but the lack of knowledge still affected her professionalism. Claire decided that to move forward in her career. That is why the girl went to East Kent College, where she studied cosmetology for two years. 
after receiving a diploma as a beauty consultant and theatrical makeup artist. In 2003, she crossed her fingers and sent applications to the most famous brands. And then, at one of the top three shopping centers in London called Harvey Nichols, they noticed her resume and invited her for an interview. Excited girl did everything to get a position at this store, and she got it. She moved to London and started working at one of the most famous department stores. Claire became very close with her colleagues. The girls were about the same age, and their interests coincided in many ways. Claire, Susan, and Natalia rented an apartment together in a safe area, about a 40-minute train ride from the shopping center. Patricia, who now lived in Tunbridge Wells with her new partner, Peter. However, Claire did not manage to see her family and friends often. As for long-term prospects and relationships with men, Claire was very picky. She was in no hurry to start serious romances. That was exactly the case until a handsome guy named Michael Petch appeared into her life. Michael got a job as a security guard at the department store in 2004. In one occasion Michael approached and asked Claire out on a date, and she was so flattered that she immediately called her mom and excitedly told her about the handsome man. Michael Petch was originally from Slovakia. He had served in the army for some time and, after working at the American Embassy in Bratislava, came to London in 2003 on a student visa. While Michael was in the United Kingdom, Slovakia joined the European Union. This meant that he could now freely stay and work in this country. Michael was nine years older than Claire and had recently gone through a divorce. At some point Claire felt that the man had become much more infatuated with her than she had anticipated, and since then she had felt out of place. For her, he was nothing more than a nice friend. Just three weeks after their first date, Claire broke off the relationship. Claire believed that before getting married or starting a serious romance, she needed to interact with different men and understand for herself what attracted her to people of the opposite sex. Claire started dating a new guy, and this romance developed very rapidly. For the first time, the girl thought that she might want to see this person as her life partner. The relationship was gaining momentum quickly. The young couple spent a lot of time together, and they were happy. Usually, Claire worked in the morning, but on September 13, 2005, she agreed to swap shifts with one of her roommates. Claire was standing at her counter across from her colleague Victoria's counter. Around 7.45 p.m., Victoria and Claire were just standing and smiling at each other, but literally within seconds, their smiles abruptly disappeared. Claire was shot to death. She was lying face up, with a large red stain spreading around her on the ceramic tiles. It appeared that she had been shot in the head several times. Next to her, lay a man with a bloodied face and arms outstretched to the side. There was a gun on the floor beside him, and shell casings were scattered around the body. It turned out that he had committed suicide by shooting himself. The mall management explained to the detectives that this was Michael Petch. The detectives learned that there had been a previous romantic relationship between the two deceased employees. Claire's roommates told the officers that Michael was constantly hanging around the cosmetics counter. Claire had met him back in January, and they had only gone on three dates. The man seemed too intrusive to the girls. He demanded that Claire spend every day with him and refused to take no for an answer. According to the roommates, it was a very toxic relationship, so Claire didn't drag it out and broke up with the security guard, but he had no intention of leaving her alone. Michael constantly stalked Claire outside her apartment windows, so she decided to move to another area, but the harassment only intensified. He didn't want to leave Claire alone. The roommates explained to the police that Michael had been fired from the mall and was under investigation by the Metropolitan Police. The police visited Patricia's house. She was already asleep when there was a loud knock on the porch. Her partner Peter went to open the front door. While he was talking to law enforcement, Patricia realized that her worst nightmare had come true. Grief and guilt overwhelmed the woman's heart. Claire's autopsy showed that she had been shot four times. The bullet to the back of the head instantly ended her life. So the three shots to the face were only meant to deprive her of her beauty. Michael wanted to take away everything that made the girl special. 
The results of Michael's autopsy showed a high level of a prohibited substance in his blood, a side effect of which is excessive aggression. It is now impossible to know whether Michael had deliberately taken this drug to give himself courage, or whether the crime was an accidental finale to an altered state of consciousness. A few days after the tragedy, the detective spoke with Patricia, the mother of the deceased girl, to find out her version of events. The woman said that after three weeks of dating, Michael began to act like he owned Claire. He didn't want Claire to leave the house at all or communicate with anyone, even with her roommates or mother. Michael wanted to spend every spare hour with Claire, making the girl feel uncomfortable. Claire didn't want to hurt him, so she tried to soften the breakup. In fact, she was going to end communication even earlier. But Michael had planned a trip to his home in Slovakia at the end of February, and Claire didn't want to spoil his mood before the vacation. The last straw was when the man asked the girl to meet him at the airport upon his return. Then he began to insist on staying at her apartment and not dragging his heavy suitcase across London. When Claire asked him to leave, he refused. That's when Claire decided to tell him about the breakup. Later, Michael began to follow the girl around the cosmetics department, watching her every move, and in the evenings he followed her all the way home or just stood guard at the entrance. He texted her 50 times a day, telling her that he loved her and repeating that they were made for each other. Then the messages became more disturbing. In them, Michael threatened to commit suicide if he couldn't be with Claire. Worse, Michael dragged his colleagues into all this, who would approach the girl during the day and try to persuade her to listen to the man in love. In their eyes, Claire clearly looked like a narcissistic who was playing with the feelings of an adult. She felt the need to smooth over the situation, so she agreed to talk to Michael and explain that they could only be friends. But all this only aggravated the already strained relationship. After his shift, he followed her home with a large bouquet of flowers and persisted until she accepted it. In the end, the flowers lay on the porch of Claire's house for a week as she left them outside, refusing to accept any gifts from this individual. She probably berated herself for ever agreeing to go on a date with this man. Claire still hoped that Michael would grow tired of pursuing her and leave her alone. At the mall, she tried to keep her concerns about this matter private. The young woman didn't want to lose her dream job due to an admirer's intrusive behavior. The stalking began to affect Claire's emotional and physical well-being. She couldn't sleep, stopped eating properly, became anxious and cried over trivial matters. Work issues arose due to tardiness and scattered attention. Her world was literally shrinking. In March 2005, Claire spotted Michael on the subway platform as she was heading home. She quickly jumped on the train. He sat opposite her and stared intently. At the stop, Claire ran again but he caught up and shoved her. The threat to report him to the police only angered him further. Michael menaced that he would then take Claire's life. That evening, the young woman called her mother and tearfully recounted the threats from her former admirer. Both women were frightened at that moment, but didn't believe he could seriously harm her. The next day, Michael was again standing at the cosmetics department window, tapping on the glass like a guilty puppy, waving his hand and publicly embarrassing Claire. He continued his phone attacks. Claire changed her number, but it didn't help. Michael somehow discovered it and continued calling and sending messages. When she blocked him, he changed his SIM card and started all over again. As soon as Michael's text messages began to include threats towards her, Claire finally mustered the courage to approach the mall's head of security, who took the accusations seriously. Using the store's cameras, he tracked the guard's behavior and transferred him to another floor. However, Michael still came to the beauty department to spy on Claire. Eventually, he was suspended from work entirely, and Claire was persuaded to go to the police, which she did. Michael was arrested, and Claire felt responsible for this. According to her mother, the girl didn't want to cause him trouble. She just wanted him to stop. Michael was released on bail under a non-molestation order aimed in English law at stopping harassment by a former partner. This meant he couldn't contact Claire, but Michael kept reappearing. The girl was terrified of the stalking. Because he wasn't causing physical harm, only emotional abuse, the police deemed him non-threatening. 
Michael was examined by a doctor who found no mental health issues. On September 14th, detectives questioned the frightened colleagues and employees of the mall about what they had witnessed the day of the murder. Victoria, who worked at the opposite counter, reported that Michael had shot Claire before she realized that she was in danger. Victoria noticed a shadow behind Claire, a man was sneaking up on her colleague like a spy. The girl thought that it was either a crazy customer trying to steal something, or Claire's new boyfriend wanting to surprise her. At that moment, the man emerged from the shadows. In his hand was a black gun aimed at the back of Claire's head. Then there was a loud bang, and she collapsed to the floor. Victoria was in complete shock. Michael fired several more shots. The rest of the people in the store were also in a complete panic, and just ran out into the street. After the interrogations, it turned out that Michael first shot Claire in the back of the head, and then three times in a row in the face. The fifth bullet accidentally hit the ceiling when the man tried to commit suicide, and the sixth and final one ended his life forever. The detectives found the hotel where Michael was staying at the time. In the room, they discovered a 40-page notebook where he made his notes. He wrote in both English and Slovak. On one page, Michael wrote down Claire's new address so the move didn't save the girls from being stalked. As it turned out, finding out the new address wasn't very difficult. Other pages of the notebook were filled with quotes about the meaning of life, about his love for Claire. The officers handling his case spoke with the mall's security service and Michael himself. The man, of course, told a completely different story of his relationship with Claire. According to him, he broke up with Claire to test her feelings. After this, the girl allegedly confessed she was in love with him, but his actions had hurt her. Now she was confused and didn't believe anything. When he realized he had made a mistake trying to find out how Claire felt about him, he begged for her forgiveness and tried to win her back. At the police station, this man swore he never wanted to cause pain to his beloved. He was sorry she was so upset because of him. When Michael once again violated the restraining order, he was arrested right outside Claire's new apartment. He raised his handcuffed wrists and smiled broadly. Eight days later, Michael was released on bail. His hearing was scheduled for late August. All this time, Claire dreaded facing Michael in court, feeling like an executioner. But this didn't happen because the lawyer convinced Michael to plead guilty to stalking to potentially receive only a six-month sentence likely suspended. Michael was due to appear in court again on September 21, 2005, for sentencing. For several months between the arrest and trial, the persistent admirer didn't show up in Claire's sight, and the girl thought this nightmare had ended. She was relieved that she wouldn't be responsible for sending him to prison for several years, and six months in confinement would just show him that he had behaved incorrectly. No one expected Michael to violate his bail conditions. Detectives investigating Claire Bernal's death were able to determine the crime's motive and what preceded it, but they still didn't know how Michael managed to acquire a gun and bring the weapon into the mall. After Michael was fired from Harvey Nichols, arrested twice, and released on bail, the police lost track of him. While on bail, Michael left the country for Slovakia in April 2005. In early May, he enrolled in a month-long target shooting course in his homeland, and on June 8th, he applied for a firearm permit with the Slovak police. This included a background check and a doctor's report. The check didn't reveal any criminal charges since Michael had not yet been convicted. After obtaining a firearms license, Michael officially purchased a compact pistol in July that was easy to conceal. Although he legally owned the weapon in Slovakia, it was prohibited in the UK. On August 11th, Michael boarded a bus back to London and hid the gun behind his back. Customs was supposed to check everyone passing through, but for some reason, Michael was never searched. He managed to smuggle the weapon and lay low until the court hearing on August 31st. All this time, he was planning an attack on Claire. Michael knew the girl's schedule and which side doors were unguarded during the day. And on September 13th, he carried out his sinister plan. Claire Bernal's funeral took place on September 26, 2005. Hundreds of people came to bid farewell to this young woman who died at the hands of a stalker. 
Claire Bernal's demise highlighted significant failures in the legal and protective systems, including allowing Pesh to travel while on bail and failing to prevent him from obtaining a weapon. The tragedy prompted calls for better measures to protect victims of stalking and harassment. Jared Clark was an 18-year-old who had just graduated from high school in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, when he was reported missing in May 2006. His body was discovered a few days later in Fort Gibson Lake, showing signs of blunt force trauma and drowning. The initial investigation into Jared's death stalled due to a lack of leads and concrete evidence. However, the case was reopened in 2012 by a new sheriff, which led to significant developments. Jarrett Austin Clark was born on April 5, 1988, in Broken Arrow, Tulsa County, Oklahoma. Jarrett was an only child of Tammy and Kevin. He brought joy to those around him. He was happy, charismatic, and had a great sense of humor. His optimistic personality made him a great motivator, and he could always sense when someone needed him. Jarrett was also the kind of person to stick up for those who needed help. He hated bullying and often defended classmates who were being picked on. At school, Jared was very involved in sports. He played football and he did weightlifting. He was very athletic and worked out constantly. In 2006, he turned 18, and on May 11th, just a month after his birthday, he graduated high school. His next step was to join the army, where he was excited to start a new chapter in his life. But before leaving, he wanted to make the most of his first summer out of school as an adult. Sadly, he wouldn't get to enjoy his newfound freedom for very long. Jared had many friends in school, but he also got along with other classmates outside of his regular friend group. So when some of these kids invited him to go on a camping trip overnight, the weekend of May 13th, to celebrate graduation, he accepted. His closer friends weren't aware he was that close to this group. But Jarrett was very charismatic and knew a lot of people, so they didn't think too much of it. That weekend was Mother's Day weekend. So when Jarrett told his parents he'd be camping on Saturday, all they asked him was to be back before 10 o'clock the next morning, so they could celebrate Mother's Day Sunday as a family. They had plans to go to Jarrett's grandmother's house for a family lunch, and he had to be there. Being as close to his family as he was, Jarrett told his parents not to worry. He wouldn't miss Mother's Day for anything. In fact, he felt bad for not being there when his mother woke up the next day, so he decided to give her an early Mother's Day present before he left. A picture frame with his graduation photo, along with some flowers. This gesture really showed what kind of a son Jarrett was, and his mother was delighted. After giving her the flowers, Jarrett packed his overnight bag and camping gear, and made his way out the door. Before he left, he turned to his mother and stepfather and told them, love you guys, like he always did before going out. Then he was off. The next morning, Tammy and Eric, Jarrett's parents woke up and had breakfast. After that, they began getting ready to leave towards their mother's day lunch. When the clock struck 10, they began getting anxious. Jarrett was never late, and if he was, he most definitely would have called to let them know. As the clock moved forward and crept towards 11, Tammy got the feeling something wasn't right. She began calling some of Jarrett's friends, but nobody had seen him. Like we mentioned earlier, the group he went camping with wasn't his close group of friends, so nobody had seen him since before he left for the campsite. The family then began calling local hospitals and police stations, in case he'd been hurt or gotten into some kind of trouble. But once again, there was no sign of him and nobody knew where he was. Tammy went to the police, but in the beginning, since it was still early in the day, officers didn't think it was a serious matter. They said he probably got drunk and was sleeping it off somewhere, or his phone ran out of battery, or perhaps he just lost track of time. They were sure he'd turn up eventually, but Tammy knew this was much more serious. Her gut was telling her Jarrett was not okay. The evening of May 14th, after finally tracking down who else was camping with Jarrett the night before, his family managed to speak with one of the teens who was also there. His name was Brandon Hargrove, 
and he had Jarrett's phone with him. Brandon told Tammy that Jarrett had left in the middle of the night, after they had an argument. According to Brandon, Jarrett was very drunk, and had tried to sexually assault one of the girls there, who happened to be Brandon's girlfriend. After confronting him, he said Jarrett had picked a fight with him, and then left the campsite on his own, but forgotten his things, and that's why Brandon had his phone. Tammy couldn't believe what she was hearing. Jarrett had never been aggressive, especially not towards women. In fact, he was usually the one to defend victims of bullying. So when this teenager she didn't even know told her her son had assaulted a girl, and then picked a fight with him, it just didn't feel like the truth. Regardless, they now knew where Jarrett had last been seen by witnesses who were there with him, and there was a chance he was injured, or lost his way back. Because the police were still brushing this off as a runaway or a drunk teenager, Jarrett's family and friends took it upon themselves to search the area for any sign of him. The campsite the group stayed at was at Fort Gibson Lake, a popular fishing and camping area, surrounded by forests with thick trees. For hours, the group searched the area surrounding the lake, shouting Jarrett's name, and keeping an eye out for any sign of him. However, they found nothing. After dark, the search was called off until the next morning, and it took another two days before the police got involved and officially began searching for Jarrett. On the third day of searching, and finally led by authorities, Jarrett's stepdad along with investigators located one of Jarrett's shoes. The position of it was odd, since it was perched on top of a rock. A few minutes later, they also located his jacket. It was beginning to look like Jarrett may have been badly hurt, and the story of him just walking away from the campsite was sounding more and more unlikely. Finally, on May 19th, nearly a week after he went missing, Jarrett was found. Floating on the lake, not far from where his clothes were found, the 18-year-old's lifeless body was recovered. The Oklahoma medical examiner found severe bruising all over Jarrett's body. It was difficult to determine whether the bruises had been inflicted on him by someone, or if they were the result of a body falling into the water. Regardless, these bruises were not the cause of death. The autopsy showed his lungs were filled with water, meaning he was still alive when he entered the lake and drowned afterwards. A toxicology report was also run, and analysis showed a minimal amount of alcohol in his system, which is believed to even be a natural reaction of the body's fluids after dying. According to the autopsy, he was in no way drunk like Brandon Hargrove had told his parents. There were also no signs of any other drug or substance that could alter his behavior. With the autopsy complete, police were starting to believe this was far from an accident, and began investigating exactly what happened to Jared Clark, and the next thing on the list was to round up the witnesses. That fateful night, there was Jared Clark. Then there was Brandon Hargrove, who knew Jared from weightlifting at school. They weren't close, but they saw each other at school frequently, and often exchanged a few words. Then there was Courtney Manzer, who was Brandon's girlfriend. She also attended the same school, but was younger than them. Dana Hargrove was Brandon's sister, and her boyfriend, Anthony Wallen, was also there. Lastly, in the group, there was another friend, Wayne Humphrey. The group was very different to Jarrett's usual friend group. Brandon was known for being short-tempered and picking fights, apart from having a record for drug use and possession. He was a jealous guy, and didn't take it well when others showed interest in his girlfriend. Many of those attending the camping trip weren't even graduating that year. It was rumored that Jarrett had a crush on Courtney, and it seemed that she was also showing an interest in him. Apparently it was Courtney herself who insisted Jarrett should come to the trip with them. Despite it not being his usual environment, Jarrett was drawn to Courtney, and decided to go and have a chance to be around her. Police first questioned Brandon, and his second version of the story was much more detailed than the one he told Tammy just hours after her son went missing. According to his statement, Jared had tried to get into Courtney's tent and force himself upon her. Brandon had then confronted him, and after a heated argument, they both got into a physical fight, punching each other. Then Jared had taken off, leaving the campsite and some of his things behind, but the last they'd seen of him, he was alive and well. The rest of the group backed up Brandon's story. However, 
Police noticed each testimony was slightly different than the other, and many details were getting mixed up. Courtney, Anthony, Wayne and Dana's retelling had confusing pieces of information, and it was hard to paint an accurate picture of what really happened that night. So police began looking for witnesses outside the group. A woman came forward. She was there that night, at a campsite right next to the one the teens were at. She was camping with her teenage son, her boyfriend and her boyfriend's brother. According to her story, they heard shouting and arguing coming from the campsite. It sounded like they were fighting over a girl. Her son went over there to try and break up the fight, but seeing that things were getting tense, he went back to his family, and they packed their stuff and left. She said they were very uncomfortable, and since her boyfriend and his brother both had records, they were afraid police could get involved, and they didn't want to be mixed into anything. In an effort to get the story straight, police talked to Courtney Manzer again. Despite originally backing up Brandon's story about Jarrett walking away, during the second interview, she gave a more detailed account. Jarrett hadn't tried to assault her. The two of them had been flirting that night, and Brandon, being the jealous type he was, got angry. Anthony, one of the other teens present, got involved and accused Jarrett of stealing his marijuana. By this point, Wayne, Anthony and Brandon were fighting and at one point restrained Jarrett and hit him repeatedly. However, Courtney's story ended just like Brandon's did. Jarrett was badly beaten, but he was alive and left the campsite on his own two feet. The teen's stories, despite being chaotic, couldn't be proved wrong since there was essentially no physical evidence in the case. Since all the witnesses present insisted he left the campsite alive, there was no way to know how Jarrett ended up drowning a few hours later. And as it often happens in these cases, the trail gradually went cold and Jarrett's story was left unsolved. Over 400 students attended Jarrett Clark's funeral. His friends and family couldn't believe he was gone, and on top of that, the circumstances of his death were still a mystery. For six years, the case went cold, but his family never gave up. The Clarks wanted action, but they were advised not to go to trial. With so little evidence available, it would be hard to build a case against Courtney, Anthony, Wayne, and Dana. Jarrett's family also suspected the Hargroves had a relative in the force who helped keep the focus away from them, slowing down the investigation and brushing away certain tips. The physical evidence was basically non-existent at this point, aside from the body in Jarrett's clothes, so police were relying on witness testimonies, which had changed so many times it was hard to keep track of what checked out and what could be a lie especially with the main witness, Brandon, gone. In 2008, Brandon Hargrove had been killed in a car accident just after being released from jail, where he served a sentence for drug possession, among other charges. He was drunk driving, he lost control of his truck, and fell into the water. Brandon drowned to death in July of 2008, just two years after Jarrett also drowned. So, Jarrett Clark's case remained open, but it was not moving in any direction. Finally, in 2012, a new sheriff reopened the investigation to work on finally answering the questions from that night in 2006. The only physical evidence in the case was the clothing recovered from the woods and Jarrett's body. Upon closer investigation, one of his socks gave out the clue that gave investigators the approach of this being a potential homicide. One of his socks had signs of being dragged along the ground. If this were true, it meant Jarrett wasn't walking on his own two feet that night, and someone had allegedly dragged him at some point. The sheriff set up a tip line, begging the public to come forward with any information that could help the case. Many of the teenagers involved in the story were now adults, and investigators hoped this could bring some sense or courage to anyone who was too scared to talk before. And from the moment it was set up, several useful tips were sent the sheriff's way. The first one was from another camper who was there that night. She had set up her tent right next to the lake, in a small clearing surrounded by trees. This woman said she was abruptly woken up in the middle of the night by headlights shining into her tent. She looked outside and saw a white pickup truck backed up almost all the way into the water. She thought it could be another group of campers who had driven too far into the mud and were trying to get out. She didn't notice anything out of the ordinary so she went back to sleep. When she heard a teenager was missing from the same lake she was camping at, 
She thought there could be something connected to what she saw, but she never came forward. Brandon Hargrove drove a white pickup truck. Jarrett's ex-girlfriend also told police that that night she received several text messages from Jarrett's number. However, they didn't seem to be written by him. Words were used out of context, and the overall style was not the way he usually texted. It made her think that they had been written by someone else, someone who could have his phone. But the tip that gave investigators reason to re-interview the witnesses was given by one of Courtney's relatives. In 2006, Courtney was living with some relatives instead of her parents, and the morning of May 14th, this witness recalls Courtney got home and was completely distraught. After asking her several times, she allegedly confessed to throwing Jarrett's body in the lake after Brandon, Anthony, and Wayne had beaten him up. She even told them they had his clothes and how they planted them to throw off the police in their efforts to find Jarrett. According to this witness, she went to the police for this information, but it was never followed up. Three days later, Jarrett's body would be found. With all this new information, police were sure they were investigating a homicide now, and decided to round up the witnesses once again and revisit the night of May 13, 2006. This is where the story the witnesses told for years began to crack. Investigators questioned the witnesses with a different approach, trying to understand if at some point, Jared had been knocked out cold. Wayne Humphrey was the first one to change his story. In 2012, he was in prison for other charges, and when he was questioned about that night, he changed his story and admitted that after an argument, Brandon had him hold Jared while he and Anthony beat him up. He said the force with which they were hitting him was so strong, he felt every blow. By the time they were done, Jared was knocked out cold. Courtney Manzer was also re-interviewed with her relative's story now on the table, and faced with the pressure of events finally catching up to her, she caved and told police what happened. That night, she said, Brandon was being arrogant and jealous, just like he usually was. They had all been drinking and taking pills, except for Jared, who she recalls barely had anything to drink. Just like it was rumored around school at the time, Courtney and Jared had developed a crush for each other and spent that night flirting. At one point in the night, they ended up in a tent together, and although they were just talking, when Brandon found them, he confronted Jared and accused him of stealing his girlfriend. The argument began to escalate, and Brandon got aggressive. Anthony and Wayne got involved too, and that's when they restrained Jared and began punching and kicking him. Jared tried to run away from the campsite, but after only a few seconds, the others caught up to him again and continued hitting him. After beating him that second time, Jared was completely knocked out. So much, in fact, they thought he was dead. Panicked at the thought of having killed their classmate, they got scared and decided to throw his body in the lake, dragging the body to Brandon's truck and backing it up near the water, like the witness saw. Brandon, Courtney, Anthony, Wayne and Dana then packed everything in the camp, took Jared's phone and his clothes, and left. Before leaving, they discussed their story and decided what they would tell the police. Then they all went home. Courtney told investigators they all truly thought their story was solid and that they were going to get away with it. With this new evidence and testimonies being much more solid than before, there was finally a case to build for the homicide that ended Jared Clark's life. In 2014, Courtney Manzer was arrested and charged with conspiracy to be an accessory after the fact. Anthony was arrested just a few months later and charged with second-degree murder. Finally Dana was arrested and also charged with covering up. Wayne Humphrey was already in prison, and Brandon Hargrove was the only one who never faced any charges, since he passed away in 2008. All four of them pleaded guilty in exchange for plea deals. In June of 2016, Tony was sentenced to eight years in prison along with 12 years of parole after pleading guilty to second-degree murder. Dana pleaded guilty to obstruction and was handed a two-year probated sentence. Courtney was given a two-year prison sentence and five years of parole after pleading guilty to conspiracy to be an accessory after the fact. The truth was finally out. It took years, but Jarrett's family finally found justice served for the death of their son. If you found this helpful, 
please click the thumbs up button and subscribe to catch more videos. You may also leave any questions or suggestions you'd like to see me cover in future videos in the comments section. In 2008, Sarah Widmer was found drowned in her bathtub in Warren County, Ohio. Her husband, Ryan Widmer, was convicted of her murder after three trials, with the key evidence being her lack of injuries consistent with a slip and fall. Ryan Widmer maintains his innocence, and the case has been controversial, with debates over forensic evidence and trial conduct. On August 11, 2008, Sarah Widmer, a 24-year-old dental hygienist, and her 27-year-old husband Ryan Widmer, a sports planner, were at their home in Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Sarah had just finished her shift at a dental office, and Ryan had finished his day as well. The couple, who met through mutual friends and quickly became inseparable, spent a quiet evening together. Their relationship had progressed from a blind date at a pub to purchasing a home, marrying, and being in the midst of newlywed bliss after only four months of marriage, as they looked forward to their future, which included plans for a Costa Rica honeymoon and a Cantoon vacation. On August 11th, Ryan and Sarah Widmer watched TV while eating leftover hamburgers, corn on the cob, and cheesy potatoes. According to Ryan, they began with some of Sarah's favorite shows before moving on to a football game. Sarah then decided to take a bath in the master bedroom bathroom. Ryan recalled that she asked him to check the doors before accompanying her upstairs. That night, Ryan dialed 911. The call lasted seven minutes. He told the 911 dispatcher that his wife had fallen asleep in the bathtub at their home in Morrow, Ohio. He told the dispatcher that he had been watching TV downstairs and went upstairs to find Sarah lying face down in the bathtub. He mentioned that she frequently fell asleep in the bathtub. Ryan followed the dispatcher's instructions and removed Sarah from the bathtub before being guided through CPR. During this time, he temporarily put the phone down to empty the tub and lift Sarah, which took approximately 29 seconds. Within six minutes of receiving the 911 call, police found Sarah naked on the bedroom floor. Her body felt warm and dry, but her hair was wet. While performing CPR, the police noticed a pinkish-white, frothy discharge coming from Sarah's mouth and nose, indicating drowning. When paramedics arrived, they made two unsuccessful attempts to intubate Sarah in her bedroom. Two more attempts were made in the ambulance during the 10-minute ride to the hospital. Despite a fifth unsuccessful intubation attempt, the hospital's emergency room physician made a sixth attempt and was successful. Unfortunately, it was too late. Sarah was pronounced dead the same night. When questioned at the hospital, Ryan told police that he and Sarah were alone at home that night. He mentioned watching a football game on the downstairs TV while Sarah was taking a bath around 10 p.m., and he expressed concern to the police that he was afraid she would fall asleep in the bathtub. When asked if Sarah had fallen asleep in the bathtub, Ryan said no, but she did have a habit of falling asleep in unusual places. Despite Ryan's claim to the police that he found Sarah in the bathtub and assumed she had fallen asleep, authorities became suspicious. When they arrived at the house, they noticed Sarah's skin was dry, but her hair was wet. Detectives noticed inconsistencies in Ryan's account, particularly during the 911 call when he described finding Sarah lying face down in the tub. There were concerns about a potential contradiction because they believed Ryan told the nurse at the hospital that he found her lying face up. During the search of the large mirror residence, law enforcement discovered several discrepancies that raised further concerns. The bathroom floor, bathroom mat, and towel on the floor were all dry. The bathtub was mostly dry, with only a few droplets visible near the drain. Notably, no wet towels were found in the home. Police discovered additional inconsistencies in Ryan's narrative. Ryan had initially told them that he was watching a Cincinnati Bengals football game on the television downstairs while Sarah took a bath. However, upon inspection, the downstairs TV was not tuned to that channel. Instead, the bedroom television was set to the specified channel. Police also discovered bloodstains on the bedroom carpet where Sarah had been found lying on the floor when they arrived. 
These findings raised suspicions and added to the growing list of inconsistencies in Ryan's account of what happened that night. Dr. Russell Updegrovi, the Warren County coroner, performed the autopsy on Sarah and his findings revealed that her cause of death was drowning. Notably, several physical injuries were documented during the examination, including faint bruising on the right side of her forehead, a specific hemorrhage on the inner surface of her eyelid, bruising on the left side of her neck, a contusion on the back of her neck, and bruising and lacerations on her upper lip. Sarah had deep muscle hemorrhaging in the front of her neck, as well as scalp contusions. Dr. Updegrovi determined that Sarah's death was the result of a homicide. He stated that Sarah's injury occurred prior to her death and was not consistent with injuries commonly associated with PPR. Toxicology reports confirmed the absence of prohibited substances and alcohol in the system. Ryan was arrested for aggravated murder on August 13, 2008, just two days after Sarah died. It was the prosecution's case that Sarah died as a result of drowning. Their argument was that the cause of Sarah's death was less important than how she died. The prosecution claimed that the 911 call, the crime scene, and Sarah's injuries all pointed to Ryan as the perpetrator of her death. Their argument revolved around the claim that he had forcibly held her underwater, causing her to drown in the bathtub. During the investigation, the police dusted the bathtub for fingerprints and discovered streak marks believed to be caused by human hands, primarily in the center of the tub. They used a superglue fuming process and reflected ultraviolet imaging to detect finger and smear marks. A forearm impression was also discovered on the bathtub, which was determined to be made by an adult male using hair follicle testing. However, the exact timing of the impression could not be determined. The prosecution also claimed that the lack of wetness inside the bathroom was incompatible with the scenario Ryan described. If Sarah had drowned and Ryan had pulled her out of the bathtub, the floor and other bathroom items would have been soaked. They emphasized to the jury that Sarah's body was dry when police arrived minutes after Ryan called 911. The prosecution cited details from the 911 call, claiming that Ryan had revealed too much information and was orchestrating the call, implying premeditation. The prosecution told the jury that a violent confrontation took place in the Widmer home that fateful night. Although the reasons for it were unknown, they brought in an expert witness who testified that it was extremely unlikely to fall asleep and drown in a bathtub without the use of prohibited substances or alcohol. According to this testimony, the sensation of water on the face or the activation of the gag reflex would usually wake up an individual, and if that didn't work, a drop in oxygen levels would do the trick. The prosecution called on coroner Updegrovi, who performed Sarah's autopsy to provide his expert opinion on the events of that night. He testified that a plausible explanation for Sarah's dried body and wet hair would be that her head was pushed over the edge of a bathtub, toilet, or sink. This act could have occurred either forwards or backwards in running water, or submerged in full water. The prosecution's central claim was that Ryan purposefully held Sarah's head underwater until she drowned, and they argued that he should be found guilty of her murder. In response, the defense argued that there was insufficient evidence to back up Ryan's claim of killing Sarah. They emphasized the couple's apparent love and argued that Ryan had no discernible motive to harm Sarah. According to the defense, those who knew Ryan had never seen him angry or raising his voice. Friends of the couple attested to their happiness and shared the belief that they were planning a bright future together. To bolster their case, the defense performed their own autopsy presumably to challenge or provide an alternative viewpoint to the findings presented by the prosecution's witnesses, particularly coroner Uptegrove. Dr. Werner Spitz, who had been retained by the defense, conducted a second autopsy on August 15, 2008, two days after the first, although he agreed with the conclusion that Sarah's cause of death was drowning. Spitz expressed a different opinion on the manner of death, saying he would have ruled it undetermined. He saw several injuries on her neck, arms near the crease of her elbow, upper lip, nape of her neck scalp, a tear in her liver, and neck hemorrhaging. Dr. Spitz was unable to definitively determine whether these injuries were the result of CPR. As a result, he stated that he would not consider her death a homicide. The defense contended that if there had been a violent altercation, as the prosecution claimed, 
there would have been evidence of it. Notably, Ryan and Sarah's nails were found to be unbroken or chipped without any injuries. The defense also brought attention to the presence of female DNA found under Sarah's fingernails, with no match identified. They contended that Sarah's injuries were most likely the result of the extended CPR and multiple intubation attempts performed that night, both inside the house and in the ambulance parked outside the house during transportation to the hospital. And in the hospital itself, the defense posited the theory that something medical, such as a seizure or cardiac ailment, could have been the underlying cause of Sarah's death. They also explained the seemingly contradictory evidence of Sarah's dried body and wet hair, claiming that skin dries more quickly than hair. In the first trial, the jury found Ryan not guilty of aggravated murder, but convicted him of murder. A few months later, however, a new trial was ordered in response to the defense's concerns. It was discovered that some jurors had conducted their own tests on how long it took them to dry after taking a bath, potentially influencing their interpretation of the evidence. Ryan's second trial was in May 2010. However, the jury was unable to reach a decision, prompting the declaration of a mistrial. Ryan's third trial began in January 2011, with additional evidence being introduced into the legal proceedings. The defense sought to establish a case that Sarah had an undisclosed cardiovascular or neurological condition that caused her to lose consciousness and drown in the bathtub. To back up this claim, they presented testimony from several medical experts who suggested the possibility of such an underlying medical issue. However, the state countered these claims by bringing in their own medical experts to challenge and refute the defense's assertions. Sarah's co-workers' testimony revealed more about her health and daily routine. They described Sarah sleeping in her car before starting work in the mornings and going out to rest during her lunch breaks. Colleagues also revealed that she suffered from allergies and had headaches and stomach pains. On at least one occasion, her headaches were severe enough to cause blurred vision, forcing her to retreat to a dark room until the symptoms passed. Dr. Benjamin Mesmer, a dentist at Sarah's practice, took the stand and testified that he was present when she died. He recalled her complaining of a headache and stomach ache that day. Sarah's friend's testimony painted a picture of her tendency to fall asleep in unexpected places such as during a game or in the middle of group discussions. One of her friends suspected she had narcolepsy, a sleep disorder characterized by excessive sleepiness, sleep paralysis, hallucinations, and in some cases, cataplexy. In contrast, Sarah's mother, Ruth, and Stewart testified for the prosecution. She stated that she had never noticed anything unusual about her daughter's sleeping habits. Sarah, however, did experience headaches. Ruth believed they were the result of sinus problems. According to Ruth's testimony, she spoke with Sarah on the day she died as she was leaving work, and Sarah made no mention of having a headache. Ruth stated that there was no family history of seizures, heart disease, or cardiac problems. Sarah had a heart murmur and a cleft palate as a baby, but a physical examination report from June 2008 made no mention of the heart murmur's continued presence. Furthermore, there was no mention of a cardiac condition, neurological defect, or disease in the report. Jennifer Cruz's testimony provided an important and potentially damaging account. According to her statements, she contacted Ryan while he was in prison after seeing a Dateline episode about his case. She claimed that on October 26, 2009, Ryan called her and confessed to Sarah's murder. Jennifer testified that Ryan stated, I did it. I killed Sarah. Furthermore, Jennifer claimed that during the 911 call Ryan only pretended to perform CPR because he knew Sarah was already dead, rendering resuscitation futile. Despite this shocking revelation, Jennifer continued to communicate with Ryan following their initial discussion. Ryan did not report the incriminating conversation to the police until after her second trial was declared a mistrial. In response to Jennifer's testimony, the defense attempted to undermine her credibility. They presented evidence of her previous prescription drug addiction and misdemeanor theft convictions, attempting to cast doubt on the veracity of her statements and motivations. The defense presented a challenging scenario, claiming that they could not definitively explain what caused Sarah to drown that night. 
The defense urged the jury to consider all of the facts in the case, emphasizing that Ryan had no apparent motive to harm Sarah. Despite these arguments, Ryan was ultimately convicted of murder and sentenced to 15 to life in prison. Interestingly, one of the jurors in the third trial cited Ryan's behavior in court as a major factor in their guilty verdict. The juror observed that Ryan made no reaction when autopsy photos were shown in court, implying that his lack of emotional response influenced the perception of his guilt. On December 14, 2019, Nadine Lott, also known as Dean, was murdered by her ex-partner, Daniel Murta. Murta inflicted severe injuries on Lott during a violent attack, leading to her death three days later. Witnesses described the attack as savage and uncontrolled. In August 2021, Daniel Murta was convicted of Nadine murder and received a life sentence imprisonment. Nadine Lott was born on October 6, 1989, in Arklow, Ireland. She was the oldest of three children, always tried to help her parents and care for her family. On December 14, 2019, around 4.25 a.m., Amelia Kalinovic called the police to report an urgent situation involving her neighbor Nadine Lott, who had been stabbed. The police arrived at the apartment of Nadine Lott, a 30-year-old beauty therapist in Arklow, Ireland, and discovered her unconscious on the kitchen floor with severe injuries. Dean's mother Claire Lott was attempting to help her daughter. The police immediately called for an ambulance, describing the Dean's condition as if she had been beaten to a pulp. Amelia Kalinovic told the police that she rushed to Nadine's apartment after hearing screams. Upon entering, she noticed Dean's ex-partner, Daniel Murtaugh, hunching over her and delivering violent blows while growling. Amelia described Murtaugh as being consumed by rage and resembling a wild animal. She immediately alerted the police and contacted Nadine's sister, Phoebe Lott, who arrived at the scene with her mother Claire in minutes. When the police arrived at Dean's apartment at night, Daniel was not there. Investigations revealed that Daniel and Nadine first met in 2012 while working in Darwin, Australia. Nadine enjoyed her job as a beauty therapist in a salon, but she returned to Ireland after a year there. Daniel moved home a few months after Nadine. Initially, the couple intended to keep their relationship going, even considering moving in together. However, the relationship eventually faltered. Nadine and their daughter Kaya then moved to an apartment in Arklow, while Daniel moved to Dublin to live with his parents. On the night of December 13, police discovered that Daniel had gone to Arklow and spent the night in Nadine's apartment, while out celebrating her aunt's birthday. When paramedics arrived the next morning, Nadine was quickly transported to the hospital. A few hours later, Daniel was arrested. At 7.30 a.m., Daniel collided with a tree while driving his Volvo, causing the vehicle to end up in a ditch. Laura was crossing Bookie's Bridge when she noticed the car in the ditch and Daniel standing by the side of the road. A concerned passerby stopped to offer help. Daniel confessed to him that he had murdered his wife because she was with a friend. Daniel was then taken to the police station for questioning, and as the interview progressed, some harrowing details about the violence perpetrated on Nadine emerged. When initially questioned by police about Nadine's condition, Daniel claimed he had no recollection due to intoxication. He initially claimed that he had slapped her following a confrontation sparked by his drinking and smoking in her apartment. However, after further questioning, he admitted to delivering five or six forceful slaps acknowledging that some were applied with significant force. Nadine's injuries were too severe to be attributed solely to a few slaps. The police persisted with the questioning. Daniel, a trained boxer, then admitted to repeatedly pounding and punching Nadine. He continued saying, I knew she was with a lad in Arklow, and I was just trying to get it out of her. When asked about the apparent lack of damage to his hands, Daniel explained that his knuckles had been conditioned over years of boxing. Despite his shock and fear at seeing blood coming from Nadine's nose and lips, he insisted that she was still alive as he left the apartment. Nadine sustained a stab wound on the right side of her neck. 
When questioned about the knife found near her, Daniel claimed it was simply a butter knife he had used the night before to cut up a burger and a battered sausage. When asked about the location of the assault, Daniel stated that everything happened in the living room. However, when the police discovered Nadine in the kitchen, he speculated that she must have walked into the kitchen on her own after he left and possibly collapsed there. The police responded by informing Daniel about apparent drag marks leading into the kitchen. Despite this evidence, Daniel maintained that he had only assaulted Nadine in the living room, which contradicted the physical evidence at the scene. When the police asked him what he used to attack Nadine, he initially stated that he used his fists. Daniel then told police he beat her with a tire pump charger and a wire wrapped around his knuckles. Daniel also admitted that he may have used a cigarette charger in a hammer motion. He denied using the mirror found in Nadine's apartment. When police entered the apartment, they found broken glass in the living room, hallway, and kitchen. Part of the mirror's frame was discovered in the kitchen. In his final police interview, Daniel described waking up on the sofa to the sound of Nadine screaming and shouting. I slapped her and she returned to the ground beside the cabinet. Standing over her, I began pounding her, only realizing the gravity of the situation when I noticed the blood. Daniel claimed he never intended to harm Nadine, expressing his love for her and asserting that it was reciprocated. He told the police that if he wanted to kill Nadine, she'd be gone. Tragically, three days after the assault, Nadine succumbed to her severe injuries, never regaining consciousness, and died in the hospital. Daniel was subsequently charged with murder. Daniel pleaded not guilty to murder, but admitted guilt to manslaughter. He acknowledged that he was solely responsible for Nadine's death. He argued that he lacked the necessary intent to be charged with murder. Daniel contended that the use of illegal substances and alcohol on the night in question played a critical role in the tragic assault on Nadine. The jury's central question was whether Daniel intended to kill or seriously harm Nadine. At the start of the trial, Daniel's attorney admitted that he had unlawfully taken Nadine's life and that he alone was responsible for the injury she sustained. The judge instructed the jury that murder is a crime of specific intent, which occurs when one person unlawfully kills another with the intent to cause death or serious injury. Despite admitting guilt to manslaughter and accepting responsibility for unlawfully causing Nadine's death, Daniel claimed that he lacked the necessary mental state. During the acts, he used the defense of intoxication. The judge explained to the jury that intoxication could be used as a defense for crimes with specific intent, potentially reducing a murder charge to manslaughter. The prosecution claimed that this case clearly constituted murder. According to their argument, Nadine was attacked violently and repeatedly in her own home by a man she knew. The prosecution claimed her ex-partner beat and stabbed her out of jealous rage. During the court proceedings, it was revealed that in the weeks preceding Dean's death, the nature of their messages indicated Daniel's desire for a relationship, despite Nadine's clear reluctance. Despite not being in a relationship, Daniel consistently referred to Nadine as his girlfriend and future wife. The prosecutor emphasized this point to the jury, claiming it was coming from his head. She makes it clear that she has no further desire to interact with him on that level simply because they fell for each other in Australia. He somehow believed he had the right to control her life and decide who she would date. The court learned that just under two weeks before her death, Nadine explicitly messaged Daniel, warning him not to threaten her and emphasizing that nothing will ever happen between them again. These messages served as proof of Nadine's unequivocal position on their relationship in court. Amila gave testimony about Daniel's condition when she saw him assault Nadine. She described how he had his hands around Nadine's neck and shoulder. Nadine's mother, Claire, also testified, expressing shock at the sight of her own daughter. When Claire arrived, Nadine was unconscious but making gurgling and gasping noises. Claire sat beside her, assuring her that they could handle the situation. Despite administering CPR, Dean's injuries were so severe that it seemed like their efforts were futile. The court also heard that a police officer drove the ambulance to the hospital, allowing the paramedics to care for Nadine during the journey. One of the paramedics, Ian Clark, testified that the call haunted him throughout his career. 
He described the scene inside Nadine's apartment as if a bulldozer had ripped through it, with broken furniture strewn about. He described it as one of the most horrific scenes he had ever witnessed, leaving his uniform covered in blood as he departed. Nadine was rushed to the hospital's emergency department, and a nurse testified in court that she was unconscious when she arrived. The nurse described Nadine's condition, pointing out that her head appeared disproportionately large in comparison to her small body, most likely due to significant swelling around her face. Nadine was admitted to the intensive care unit after receiving her initial treatment. Nurse Leah Grant, who works in the IQ, testified in court, describing Dean's shocking knee injuries. Leah stated that Nadine was unrecognizable. She emphasized the gravity of the situation by describing an incident in which the Dean's mother brought in a photograph of her. Leah's colleagues couldn't identify the person in the picture, so she pointed to Nadine and said that's her. The woman in the hospital bed bore no resemblance to Nadine in the photograph due to the severity of her injuries. Leah testified that the severity of Dean's injuries made it impossible to examine her pupils, particularly her right eye, which was so swollen that it could not be opened. Nadine received 42 units of blood in the first 24 hours of her hospital stay. Leah informed the jury that Nadine's hair contained numerous shards of reflective glass, and her nose continued to bleed profusely. The prosecution shocked the court by revealing that the Dean had 64 distinct injuries on her body that could not be explained by medical intervention. Dr. Linda Mulligan, the chief pathologist, testified about Nadine's injuries. Dr. Mulligan stated that Nadine's death was caused by hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, which resulted from cardiac arrests caused by severe head and neck injuries. Dr. Mulligan clarified that blunt force injuries were consistent with being caused by hands, fists, or feet, but the use of a blunt weapon could not be ruled out. Dr. Mulligan summarized her findings and concluded that the injuries were the result of a sustained assault with both blunt and sharp force trauma. Dr. Stephen Clifford, a forensic scientist, testified that the amount of blood splatter found in the kitchen indicated a sustained assault. Nadine was on the floor there. The prosecution claimed that Nadine was attacked both in the living room and in the kitchen. The defense claimed that the violent incident that resulted in the bloodbath would not have occurred if Daniel had not been under the influence of alcohol and illegal drugs in court. Daniel claimed that he and Nadine had reconciled several times since their return from Australia and were together when she died. Daniel stated that they had been in a relationship for several weeks and planned to tell their families about it during Christmas. Daniel admitted to using substances in the hours before the incident. He claimed that his brutal and violent attack on Nadine was motivated by his substance abuse. In the closing arguments, the prosecutor urged the jury to find Daniel guilty of murder, emphasizing the apparent clear intent demonstrated by his actions. On the other hand, the defense urged the jury to focus on the intent aspect, presenting it as the case's central battleground. They asked the jury to consider the degree of intoxication on the night of the incident as a mitigating factor. On August 5, 2021, a jury at the Central Criminal Court unanimously convicted Murtaugh of murdering Latt, rejecting his defense after nearly six hours of deliberation over two days. He was then sentenced to life imprisonment on October 4, 2021, as required by law. Claire Light delivered a victim impact statement during the sentencing describing how the Latz family has been haunted by Nadine's terror, fear, and panic during the prolonged and evil attack that fateful night. She emphasized that the family is now dealing with traumatic counseling rather than hobbies, experiences, night terrors, and sleepless nights, and that life is being replaced with mere existence. Brenda Condon, a 28-year-old bartender at Carlsbad Tavern in Spring Township, Pennsylvania, went missing on February 27, 1991. Her last known whereabouts were between 12.45 and 1.15 a.m. that night. Her car was found in the bar's parking lot, but her purse and keys were missing. The bar was left in an orderly state with no signs of struggle or robbery, though her black cowboy boots were found neatly placed in the men's restroom. Despite extensive searches and investigations, her whereabouts remain unknown, 
and her case is classified as an endangered missing person. Brenda Condon was born on March 1, 1962, in Clearfield County, Pennsylvania, a vibrant and promising tanager, deeply cherished by her family and admired by her peers. A dedicated student, excelled academically, consistently ranking near the top of her class. Described as methodical and hardworking, Brenda graduated from Clearfield Area High School in 1980 as Brenda Kuhn. The blue-eyed Caucasian, reddish-brown-haired woman was loved and admired by all who knew her. Brenda was described by her family, friends, and co-workers as kind, friendly, and reliable. Brenda had two children with her ex-husband, Thomas L. Condon Jr. She and Thomas used to live in Clearfield, where they raised their children, Shauna and Todd. According to her older sister, Iris Myers, somewhere along Brenda and Thomas's marriage, their love began to run dry and they eventually drifted apart. Their divorce was amicable, and they didn't have to deal with a custody arrangement. Brenda didn't want to keep her children from their schools, friends, and family, so she decided that Shauna and Todd would live with their father, Thomas. Brenda could always come pick up the children anytime she wanted to spend time with them. Todd also mentioned that his parents spoke over the phone about different things. Their relationship was good and healthy. After the divorce, Brenda had moved to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, where she started her own home cleaning service. The informal arrangement between Brenda and Thomas regarding their children continued without any problems. Brenda moved on with her love life when she started seeing Greg Palazzari, and their relationship lasted strong for two years. Brenda wanted to be closer to her children, who still lived in Clearview with her ex-husband Thomas, so she decided to move in with her boyfriend Greg, who lived in Harvest Circle State College. This was a few months before the mother of two disappeared. So she moved to State College and opened a second branch of her home cleaning service. In February of 1991, she decided to get a second job as a part-time bartender at Carl's Bad Tavern, located at 1796 Zion Road in Spring Township. By February 26, 1991, Brenda had been working at the bar for two weeks. It was her job to close the bar after the last call, clean up, and then begin her day shift at 10 a.m. the next day. When the day crew came in for work the next morning, Brenda's absence wasn't noticed. The morning shift carried on as normal. Nothing seemed to miss. The bar was clean, the receipts had been put away from the previous night, and the lights were turned off. There were no signs of a break-in or robbery. No one noticed that Barbara wasn't at work. The day shift ended at 6 p.m., and her co-workers finally noticed that they hadn't seen her all day. Her car was in the parking lot and her shoes were neatly placed in the men's bathroom, but her car keys and purse weren't found. Her co-workers tried to remember the last they'd actually seen her, and they narrowed it down to 12.45 p.m. to 1.15 a.m. on February 27th. She was last seen talking to an unknown man inside the bar. Brenda was reported missing that evening, and the police believe this report was made 17 hours after Brenda actually went missing. However, the authorities didn't investigate her disappearance. Brenda was supposed to pick up her two children in Clearview on March 2, 1991 for visitation. Brenda loved her children and would never stand them up if she could help them. Maybe she took a quick solo trip to clear her head without telling anyone. It was unlike her, but it was better than accepting that something terrible might have happened to her. Everyone was expecting her to show up in Clearview on March 2nd so that they could put their anxiousness behind them. When Brenda's loved ones heard the news, they couldn't believe it. Brenda's 29th birthday was in two days, and she made plans before her disappearance. She and her boyfriend Greg were supposed to have a fancy birthday dinner on March 1st, 1991, and on the following day, she was supposed to pick up her children. They were supposed to visit her new home and have a little late birthday celebration. Even if Brenda had taken a break, she would still pick up her children. 12-year-old Todd and 10-year-old Shauna stood outside their father's house with their bags packed, waiting for their mother. The hours went by slowly, and they watched several cars drive past them, but they never saw Brenda's 1986 Mercury Capri. 
Realizing that his ex-wife and the mother of his children might actually be in danger, Todd explained the situation to the children, and the official investigation for Brenda's disappearance began. An extensive search of the area was conducted in the search for Brenda. Police took dogs, rescue groups, and helicopters, searching every square inch of the area around Carlsbad Tavern. But nothing came up. Local and state police claimed to have conducted numerous interviews, but received no solid results. There were no signs of a struggle, break-in, or robbery inside the bar. Brenda had cleaned up and put away the receipts from the previous shift which indicated that she was probably ready to go home. However, the bar was unlocked when the day shift crew clocked in and a cigarette vendor who came to replace the machine recalled that he'd not seen anyone in the bar. So investigators had speculated that whatever had happened would have been in the bar as she prepared to leave. They were able to get the descriptions of three male patrons at the bar that night. While the involvement of these men in Brenda's disappearance is still up to speculation, no one has been able to identify them since 1991. The police initially focused on Brenda's ex-husband, Thomas Condon, as a suspect. However, he had a solid alibi. He was busy helping his sister, Pamela Condon, move into her new apartment around the time Brenda went missing. Thomas also took a polygraph test which relieved him of every suspicion by the authorities. Greg Palazzari, Brenda's boyfriend at the time, was also cleared of every suspicion. The police released every known information about Brenda's disappearance, including the sketches of the three men at the bar, to the public. The first man was described as 38 to 40 years old, 6 feet 2 inches, wearing a bright blue down jacket and jeans. The second was 25 to 30 years old and 5 feet 8 inches and wearing a black leather coat, a white button-down shirt and jeans. The third patron was approximately 50 years old and 5 feet 8 inches, wearing a short dark-colored jacket, dark-colored slacks, and a brown plaid shirt. A $5,000 reward was also promised to anyone with useful information. Brenda was speculated to be a homicide victim, but without a body, the police had to stick with a missing persons case until something new came up. The Spring Township Police Department had handled the initial investigation back in 1991. In 2008, it was transferred to state police at the request of Spring Township Trooper Brian Wakefield. In a surprising turn of events, in 2014, Greg Palazzari was arrested and convicted for operating a large cocaine ring out of the Sunoco gas station he owned. He was sentenced to 5 to 10 years, but he couldn't complete his sentence as he died on April 21, 2016. Nancy Jones, the woman Greg dated after Brenda's disappearance, had come out to say she believed that Greg might have had something to do with Brenda going missing. She didn't think he could have murdered Brenda, but Nancy believed that Greg might have gotten into trouble with his drug dealing and put Brenda in harm's way. This theory was never proven and authorities instead believed Brenda's murder might be linked to her workplace. Interestingly, it came to light that shortly after Brenda's disappearance, Carl's Bad Tavern had closed down. The police speculated that Brenda's attacker strategically placed her boots in the men's bathroom. Brenda's son, however, thinks otherwise. He recalled that his mother loved and owned a lot of boots, but she never cleaned when wearing them. She would usually change into sneakers, which she found more comfortable. If Brenda had been cleaning, she probably took the boots off herself. Her family continued to stay positive, believing that she was still out there somewhere. On the 10th anniversary of Brenda's disappearance in 2001, police held a press conference with her family about the case, opening up about their lack of leads, the unidentified patrons at the bar, and the choice to put her case on a national database system for missing people. Along the way, Shauna had a daughter of her own now. She was heartbroken that her mother had not gotten the chance to be there for her granddaughter. Brenda's sister, Iris, had said that Shauna's daughter looked so much like her missing grandmother. 2020 marked the years Brenda had been missing longer than she'd been seen alive, and it was hard for everyone. In April 2024, this case gained renowned attention. Detective Kenneth Maines, a renowned investigator celebrated for solving cold cases in central Pennsylvania and hosting the popular Unsolved No More podcast, took up the challenge of unraveling the mystery. After 33 years since Brenda's puzzling disappearance, 
he believes he's cracked the case. In a 26-episode YouTube series, he explained what he thought happened to Brenda and who the perpetrator was. According to Maines, this perpetrator was Brenda's co-worker, who was known to be a hot-headed womanizer. Members of Carlsbad Tavern crew also affirmed that this co-worker was incredibly obsessed with Brenda's missing person case. Although Brenda had cleaned up, there was a single bottle of beer and some money left on the bar. Maines believed Brenda was done for the night, and his co-worker was waiting for her to close. He also added that this man had been trying to flirt with Brenda, so he took her boots to the men's bathroom and waited for her in the dark. Maines had turned over his findings to Brenda's family, so they may take them to state police investigators. He also offered a $10,000 reward in addition to the $5,000 reward the Pennsylvania State Police was offering anyone with credible information concerning Brenda's case. He said that he hopes the offender comes forward, giving Brenda's family closure, resolution, and peace, which they desire and deserve. Although Maines believed Brenda Condon's case is now solved, officially it still remains open. However, the police claim to have a few new leads that can't be disclosed to the public yet. Anyone with information about Condon's disappearance is urged to contact PA Crime Stoppers by calling 1-800-4PA-TIPS or 1-800-472-8477 or visiting the online tip line. Tips may also be provided to Pennsylvania State Police Rockview Station, which is handling the investigation by calling 814-355-7545. Despite extensive searches and investigations, her whereabouts remain unknown, and her case is classified as an endangered missing person. Lonnie Franklin Jr., also known as the Grim Sleeper, was a convicted serial killer who preyed on vulnerable young black women in South Los Angeles over more than two decades. His killing spree began in 1984 and appeared to end in 2007, with a notable gap in the murders from the late 1980s to the early 2000s, which earned him his moniker. In 2016, Franklin was convicted of 10 murders and one attempted murder. His conviction was a significant moment for the families of the victims, many of whom had waited decades for justice. Franklin was sentenced to death and died in his prison cell in San Quentin in 2020. In the mid-1980s, several different serial killers were active within California, most of them preying on women. A number of them even stated that they found it quite easy to take a stranger home. However, the case of the Crim Sleeper was slightly different. The women who were found murdered were usually found covered underneath dirty carpets or mattresses, while hidden from plain sight. Their bodies would be stashed deep inside dark alleys that were seldom visited, which made it quite difficult for the police to be able to find those bodies. Oftentimes, the only way that the bodies were found was when the smell of effluvium from the decomposing body became so strong that it alerted passers-by. Some were even stashed deep in trash bags and stowed in dumpsters. There was a pattern, however, in all of the killings, which ultimately led the police to determine that this was the work of a new killer. First of all, apart from one man, they were all women. Most were young, while others were middle-aged. Another clear indicator was the fact that all of these women were black. A significant percentage of the women had been shot primarily at close range with the use of a small caliber handgun, but some had been strangled to death. A large majority of these women suffered from drug problems, but most importantly, most of them had also been raped before they were killed and their bodies were disposed of. In those times, the streets of southern Los Angeles, also known as South Central, were primarily forgotten. The people had become tired of the police mainly because they were largely ignored by them. And worse of all, the crack epidemic was in full flow during those times. A majority of prostitutes were also killed during those times, mainly because they were the ones who had to make the most use of the streets. There were approximately 800 murders every year from 1985 to 1989, and these numbers mainly blended into the average counts. However, it took quite a while for the police to figure out that they had a serial killer amongst all of this. 
The first victim that was reported to be killed was Deborah Jackson, who was 29 years old at the time. She was a simple cocktail waitress and had only just left her friend's apartment and was walking to the bus stop when she was apprehended and killed. Three gunshot wounds were found on her chest. The body was found on August 10, 1985. Then, silence for a year. Henrietta Wright was the next victim. Her body was found only a few miles away from where Jackson's body was discovered. This time, the body had been a victim of sexual assault and had then been shot in the chest as well. Her body was found on August 12, 1986. No more than two days had passed when the LAPD uncovered another body, this time of a man. The pattern had been broken. Thomas Steele was 36 years old and was reported to be working as a pimp who was visiting from San Diego when he was shot and his body was found amid an intersection. A large number of the victims were out for casual strolls or were running an errand. After Steele, the next body that was discovered was that of a young 23-year-old by the name of Barbara Ware. Her body was found on January 10, 1987. Pernita Sparks was his next victim. She had only just gone out to grab some cigarettes, but unfortunately never returned home again. She was 26 years old. Her body was found on the same day, on April 15, 1987. The crim sleeper was actively stalking him black women, and by this time, the police had put up flyers of all kinds to make sure women were aware of what was going on on the streets. Pernita's body was found hidden in a dumpster on Western Avenue. She was beaten, strangled and finally shot in the head. It was a brutal attack. The next victim targeted by the crim sleeper was Mary Lowe, 26 years old at the time of her death. I went out to celebrate Halloween night at Love Trap Bar. She was caught by the killer at some point while traveling to and from the bar. Her body was found on November 1st in a dark alley, back on Western Avenue. However, her death was of great significance because a neighbor saw her riding a red slash orange Ford Pinto with a racing stripe on the hood. The neighbor was also able to identify a rough photo of the driver, indicating that he was male, young and black. Lacrika Jefferson was next. Her death was also important in the grand scheme of things. Her body was found on January 30, 1988. She was only 22 years old at the time. But the way her body was displayed showed that the killer was trying to create a means of communication through his victims. Jefferson's body was also found in an alley with her face covered with a handkerchief. But the napkin had the word AIDS written on it. The police were unable to find any kind of evidence as to why or how this happened. Investigations were underway at this point, and community members had already created the Black Alliance to fight serial murders. The main purpose of this organization was to take more stringent measures to ensure that serial killers are caught and arrested as quickly as possible. This organization began to put pressure on the police to create a task force dedicated to locating the Grim Sleeper and they also began distributing thousands of leaflets in the streets to make people aware of his killer. Flyers were distributed throughout South Central, some even as far as Beverly Hills, raising awareness of what was happening in those areas. A reward was also established by the city government after the coalition pressed them to make serious efforts to apprehend the serial killer. This resulted in the police finding out that several serial killers were at large for killing women. An arrest was even made as a sheriff's detective by the name of Ricky Ross was captured. However, the police later released him, stating that a major error had been made in ballistics. Continuing, the next murder occurred on the 11th of September in 1988. 18-year-old Alice Monique Alexander lost her life to brutal strangulation and shots to the chest. She had also been raped before her death. A major break was made in the case on November 20th. 1988, when the only survivor of the Grim Sleeper managed to live through to tell her tale. In Etre Marchette, a pseudonym that was given to avert attention from the media managed to survive the horrific attack. She was on her way to the store and was going to a party when a well-dressed man driving an orange kento with white racing stripes on the hood blocked her path. He asked to give her a ride, though she politely refused. However, he said that black women think of themselves very highly after which she eventually relented. As she sat in the car, 
she was very impressed. The interior of the car was as neat and clean as could be and had been maintained to near perfection. She later said that the conversation was getting awkward and she eventually invited him to the party. Along the way, the man made a stop for 10 minutes to meet with someone and then returned to the car. An argument ensued, and soon after the man brought out a gun from a pocket located in the driver's side of the car and shot her point blank in the chest. She also stated that he had chronicled his actions with a Polaroid camera. She blacked out at first, but the flash of the camera opened her eyes. She baked this handsome black man to let her go, to drop her off at the hospital, but instead, he threw her out of the car while it was still moving. He thought that she would not live to see the light of day any longer, but call it a miracle or an act of the divine, Marquette managed to get back to her friend's house. As her friends returned from the party, they immediately took her to the emergency room where she was able to survive. Her testimony was very important. She told the police about the man, which led the police to believe that this man was targeting prostitutes. The ballistics from the bullet matched the prior killings. Perhaps it was this botched incident which spoke the killer but for the next 14 years, the grim sleeper slept. Fast forward to 2002, and all that changes again. The next three killings occurred in 2002, and 2003, and the last occurred in 2007. Young Princess Barthemire lost her life at the age of 15, whereas Valerio McCorvey was killed at the age of 35. The last victim, Junisia Peters, died at the hands of the Grim Sleeper at the age of 25. It was the evidence uncovered by Barthemeyer's murder that led to a break in the case. Yet, it wasn't until 2010 that an arrest was finally made. Janisha Peters was found in a dumpster, tied up in a garbage bag and her body was discovered on New Year's Day. With firm DNA matches made from the murders that had occurred 14 years ago, the police concluded that the old murderer had finally returned, and now it was time to put a permanent stop to his activities. This was the time when a nickname Grim Sleeper was also introduced. A series of new information was put out to the media, which included updated information regarding the murderer. Familial DNA analysis was carried out, which ultimately tied the murders to the son of Franklin as it was a partial match to the DNA found on the bodies. Franklin was trailed for quite a while, in an attempt to get his DNA match. However, this was proving to be pretty difficult. The Los Angeles District Attorney at the time, Steve Cooley, eventually made use of a piece of discarded pizza to find the missing link. Franklin's first mistake was that he went out to buy pizza without noticing that he had a tail. Then, he left the discarded pizza along with the utensils on the table only after eating, which was later used to track his DNA. The waiter at the restaurant where Franklin ate was undercover. The arrest of Lon Franklin Jr. led to global media coverage. Three days later, Lonnie Franklin Jr. was caught in a major arrest that involved more than 30 cops on the scene. An original film was also created of the scene, entitled The Grim Sleeper. However, the case was far from over as yet. In March of 2011, Lonnie Franklin Jr. was indicted and an initial charge for the murder of Monique Alexander was placed along with that of nine other women that he had killed. This extended to a charge of 11 murders, along with one attempted murder. Later, a map was created of the crime scenes, and it showed that the house of Lonnie Franklin Jr. fell almost right in the middle of the field where the murders were committed. It was expected that the grand jury indictment was going to bring the trial to a speedy end. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Franklin, having been placed in a solitary cell at the men's central jail has created a very robust defense so far. He has even managed to bring in his loyal wife, Sylvia Franklin, who is a school employee at Inglewood into the life he leads in prison. And he has also attracted the visits of Victoria Redstall, a pretty blonde actress slash author who often likes to befriend serial killers. Even today, Lonnie Franklin Jr. continues to drive his pension of $1,700 each month which was given to him courtesy of the L. A medical pension program. He has even made disjointed remarks to the families of the deceased, subjecting them to further trauma. The case has been delayed continuously. 
When you think about the fact that Lonnie Franklin Jr. was 61 years old when he was apprehended, it goes on to show that he has lived virtually his whole life without any retribution. If this continues, he will likely live the rest of it without any retribution either. Many of the victims' families thought that once Franklin had been captured, the worst was now gone. There was to be no more killing, and they would get deserved justice as Franklin would be put on death row. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Seymour Amster is the defense lead in the case of Lonnie Franklin, and he has created several procedural halts and delays in the case. Even though evidence has been available for months, it remains unclear as to whether the defense team has finished up with their DNA testing. The police have also uncovered further information, and have now made Franklin the prime suspect in the killing of at least six more women, which would mean that the loss of life attributed directly to his actions would be around 18. This number is also expected to grow. It was also discovered that the number of survivors who have managed to live the attacks by Lonnie Franklin has also grown. Even though the police are refusing to put a final death count on the number of cases linked directly to Franklin, it is expected that this number revolves around the 100 mark. His trial began on July 14, 2014. Since being arrested and put into prison, Franklin has lost more than 40 pounds. He was in a solitary cell alongside another serial killer who has been charged with killing three prostitutes and a hitchhiker. The case files are spread over a total of 20,000 pages, making it a massive investigation. It remains to be seen whether the court of justice and this feigned system of law will bring justice in this case. Franklin was convicted in 2016 of the murders of nine women and a teenage girl in Los Angeles from 1985 to 2007. After a three-month trial, he was sentenced to death. After finally being sentenced to death, Franklin died in his prison cell. At the age of 67 in San Quentin Prison on March 28, 2020. Michelle McNeil, a former beauty queen and wife of Martin McNeil, was found dead in the bathtub of her home on April 11, 2007. Initially, her death was considered accidental, but suspicions arose due to Martin McNeil's behavior and circumstances surrounding the case. Michelle's daughters were suspicious of their father, noting his odd behavior and inconsistencies in his story. They discovered that Martin had pressured Michelle to undergo cosmetic surgery shortly before her death and that he had improperly administered medications to her. The initial autopsy concluded Michelle's cause of death was natural, citing heart disease. However, after further investigation, a second autopsy revealed that Michelle had a combination of drugs in her system that could have been fatal. The case remains a significant example of how persistent investigation and family advocacy can lead to justice, even when initial findings suggest otherwise. Michelle Marie Summers was born in 1957. She grew up in Concord, California. Michelle was described as popular and athletic. She was great in school. She also loved music and she played the violin. Her diverse experiences included being an exchange student in Switzerland, pursuing a modeling career, and winning the title of Miss Concord in 1976. On April 11, 2007, Michelle McNeil, a 50-year-old mother was recovering at home from surgery. Michelle's daughter, Alexis Summers, initially cared for her after she was released from the hospital, but her husband, Dr. Martin McNeil, eventually took over her care. Michelle and Martin met at an event for young Mormon singles, and they married when Michelle was only 21 years old. They are still married nearly three decades later. Martin, a practicing psychiatrist, and Michelle, a former beauty queen turned model, shared a desire for children, eventually expanding their family to include four biological children within a short period after marriage, as well as adopting four children, three of whom are from Ukraine. Martin escorted his young daughters to school on April 11, leaving four adult children and four minor children at home the previous day. Alexis, who had left to resume medical school, called Michelle at 8.45 am to check on her health. 
Michelle assured Alexis that she was doing fine. Michelle had a facelift just over a week earlier, on April 3rd, and was on prescription medication with instructions to rest. Alexis had cared for her for a few days before returning to school, and Michelle told her she felt fine and planned to pick up the girls later that day. After dropping the girls off at school, Martin went to work, where he received an award and asked a photographer to take a picture of him. After the award ceremony, he picked up his daughter at 11.30 a.m. and drove them home. When they returned, calls to Michelle went unanswered, prompting Martin and his daughter to look for her throughout the house. They discovered Michelle submerged in the bathtub, fully clothed. Martin instructed his daughter to seek help, and she dashed to a neighbor's house. Martin dialed 911 and informed the dispatcher that he was performing CPR. He also informed a colleague that he was running a code on his wife. When Alexis called Martin, he delivered the distressing news, your mother is in the bathtub and she is not breathing. Concerned neighbors rushed into the bathroom to help and noticed Martin bent over Michelle's face. Michelle lay face up, her head under the faucet, and her legs and feet inside the bathtub. With the help of the neighbors, Michelle was lifted from the bathtub, and Martin began CPR. Once paramedics arrived, they took over the resuscitation efforts. During this process, Michelle made a gurgling sound and expelled a large amount of fluid from her mouth several times. Martin told the paramedics that he hadn't been away from the house for long, and that Michelle may have overdosed on pain medication and slipped in the tub, hitting her head. Martin discovered Michelle slumped over the bathtub, with her lower body outside. Michelle was declared dead on arrival at the hospital. Dr. Maureen Fricker, the medical examiner, concluded that Michelle's death was natural and caused by cardiovascular disease, specifically hypertension and myocarditis. Within nine days of Michelle's funeral, Gypsy Gillian Willis moved into Martin's home. Martin initially told his children that he had hired her as a nanny to look after the remaining four young children at home. However, Martin's adult children were concerned about the situation. When Alexis asked about his relationship with Gypsy, Martin told her to leave the house. It was later discovered that Gypsy was not working as a nanny. Instead, she remained reserved. Riding with Martin as his partner, they went to Wyoming together, where Gypsy introduced Martin to her family as her fiancé and even took the name Julian McNeil. Martin unexpectedly proposed to a Gypsy just three months after his wife died. Alexis, her sister Rachel, and Michelle's sister, Linda Clothes, had suspicions about the purported natural cause of Michelle's death, and convinced that Michelle had been murdered urged the police to reinvestigate the case. Reaching out to various Utah newspapers, the governor's office, and authorities requires persistent efforts, which eventually leads to Michelle's case being reopened. A toxicologist examined the autopsy toxicology report and discovered that Mikkel's blood contained concentrations of Valium, prococaine for Nerogen and Ambien, that were sufficient to render her severely abtunded and difficult to arouse. A medical examiner, Dr. Todd Gray, reviewed the report and changed the cause of death from natural to undetermined. Michelle's cause of death was reclassified as a combination of heart disease and drug toxicity which differed from the previously attributed heart disease. As the investigation into Martin's background progressed, it revealed a life founded on deception. Martin committed fraud in his 20s, writing forged checks to fund his lavish lifestyle. His criminal record included convictions for forgery and grand theft, which resulted in a 180-day prison sentence. Following his release, Martin enrolled in medical school using two falsified transcripts. He had submitted someone else's transcript during the application process. Furthermore, police discovered that Martin had falsely claimed to be schizophrenic in order to get a discharge from the military. Following his discharge, he received $3,000 per month from Veterans Affairs for more than three decades, and the police looked into the case further. Following Michelle's death, Martin attempted to arrange the adoption of the three children they had adopted from Ukraine. To facilitate this, he devised a deceptive plan involving one of his daughters, 16-year-old Giselle McNeil, disguised as a summer vacation. Martin and Gypsy assumed her identity. Gypsy obtained a fraudulent social security number, Idaho cards, and birth certificate, 
and the two went to court, successfully changing Giselle's birth date by 20 years. Martin and Gypsy were convicted of identity theft and other federal charges, and both pleaded guilty to state fraud charges after Martin served three years in prison. He was later charged with murder, first-degree felony and obstruction of justice, tenth-degree felony and obstruction of justice, sixth-degree felony. The prosecution claimed Martin committed premeditated murder against his wife. They claimed that he coerced Michelle into getting a facelift as part of a meticulously planned murder. According to the prosecution, Martin persuaded the surgeon who performed the facelift to prescribe specific medications required to carry out the crime. Martin allegedly drugged Michelle after her cosmetic surgery and then drowned her in their bathtub. The prosecution claimed Martin's motive was a desire to be with his mistress, Gypsy. The court learned that Martin actively encouraged Michelle to have a facelift despite her lack of prior interest in the procedure. Martin's behavior changed dramatically when he turned 50. According to testimony, including a renewed commitment to exercise, weight loss, and tanning salon visits, Michelle, concerned about a potential affair, questioned him about his sudden obsession with his appearance. Martin responded by suggesting that she focus on her appearance and consider a facelift. Michelle confided in her daughter Alexis in March 2007, fearing that Martin was having an affair. Michelle investigated Martin's phone records and discovered a frequently dialed number, raising suspicions of infidelity. When she confronted him, Martin dismissed her concerns as baseless. In an attempt to divert her attention, he offered to pay for Michelle's facelift and suggested they go on a two-week cruise afterwards. Contrary to Martin's claims, the prosecution claimed that he had been having an affair since November 2005. Gypsy Willis, the woman he later claimed to have met only after Michelle's funeral, where he purportedly hired her as the children's nanny. The two met online first, and Gypsy confirmed that she was aware of Martin's marital status. The prosecution claims that Martin began plotting Michelle's murder months before her death in order to facilitate his relationship with Gypsy. They claimed he feigned illness to establish an alibi, making it appear unlikely that he would physically attack his wife. Martin discussed conflicting health concerns with various people who walked with a limp and used a cane. At church, he told the congregation that he had cancer and had less than a year to live. Meanwhile, he told colleagues a variety of stories about his health, ranging from peripheral neuropathy in his toe to cancer in his big toe and neurological problems. The prosecution then detailed Michelle's surgery and the events that followed, emphasizing that it was Martin's post-death actions that raised serious concerns in the case. In March 2007, Martin set up meetings with a plastic surgeon for Michelle, who actively participated in the consultations and appointments. Despite her nervousness, Michelle agreed to have the surgery. Martin accompanied Michelle to a visit with a primary care physician prior to the procedure to ensure her safety. During this visit, Michelle's primary care physician discussed her high blood pressure and suggested postponing the surgery. Despite this advice, Martin and Michelle went to see the surgeon for a preoperative evaluation, accompanied by Alexis. Before the appointment, Alexis noticed Martin jotting down medications he wished the doctor would prescribe. On her way to the appointment, Michelle expressed her desire to postpone the surgery in order to better manage her blood pressure. Martin, incensed by the suggestion, retorted, if you don't have the surgery, you won't get it. Typically after a facelift, a pain reliever, antibiotic, sleeping medication, anti-inflammatory, and eye ointment have all been prescribed. Martin, on the other hand, asked the surgeon for more and stronger medications, such as oxycodone, a stronger pain reliever, liquid Lortab, a larger dose of Finnegan and Valium, and an anti-anxiety medication. The surgeon agreed to Michelle's requests, but cautioned her to take each pill separately and not all at once. Michelle had the surgery two days later, despite the fact that it was supposed to take only one day. She expressed a desire to stay overnight at the hospital. Martin, however, expressed his displeasure and insisted that she return home. The surgeon intervened and insisted Michelle stay overnight. She was finally allowed to return home the next day. When Michelle returned home, Alexis noticed that she appeared overly sedated. When she inquired about it, 
Martin explained that he may have given too much medication. Alexis, concerned for her mother's well-being, offered to take charge of Michelle's medication. Michelle herself told Alexis that Martin had given her too much medication, causing her to vomit, to prevent potential medication overuse. Michelle asked Alexis to let her feel each pill so she could identify them, as she still had bandages on and couldn't see at that point in her recovery. Michelle's recovery improved over the next few days. After her bandages were removed, she regained independence and mobility. She even began reducing the prescribed dosages of her medications. Despite Michelle's improving condition, Martin requested that the surgeon refill her Percocet and Finogen prescriptions. The surgeon complied with the request. Alexis returned to school, confident that Michelle was recovering well and capable of managing on her own. Unfortunately, Michelle was discovered dead the following day. The jury learned about the strange circumstances surrounding Michelle's discovery in the bathroom. Martin's youngest daughter reported that on the day Michelle died, Martin picked her up from school and when they returned home, they discovered Michelle fully clothed in the bathtub. According to reports, Martin dialed 911. However, they provided a false address and abruptly hung up. During the second call, he stated, Martin informed the dispatcher that he was unable to lift Michelle and was draining the bathtub before hanging up. The dispatcher called back, but Martin hung up on witnesses including neighbors who had seen Michelle in the bathtub. One neighbor testified that they performed chest compressions while Martin leaned over Michelle's head to administer rescue breaths, but they did not see his mouth come into contact with Michelle's mouth. Only when the paramedics took over Keepy did Michelle's color change and a gurgling sound emerge. The jury was informed of discrepancies between Martin's account of how Michelle was discovered and others' recollections. Martin claimed she was hunched over the bathtub, with her lower half not submerged, which contradicted his daughter's and neighbor's descriptions. Furthermore, the emergency room doctor found no injuries on Michelle consistent with a fall into the bathtub. Alexis returns home after learning about Michelle's death. She discovered that Michelle's medication, as well as the hospital bed and blankets, had gone missing. In the garage, Alexis discovered a pile of wet towels, clothing, and the bathroom rug. Martin's son Damien and his girlfriend Eileen returned to the house following Michelle's death. Martin asked Eileen to flush Michelle's pills down the toilet. Eileen testified that she complied and observed that some of the pill bottles were nearly empty. Contrary to Martin's claim of blood everywhere, she found no blood in the bathroom. The court heard that, on the day Michelle died, Martin communicated extensively with Gypsy, speaking twice on the phone and exchanging 30 text messages. During the trial, the prosecution presented a cardiologist who testified that Michelle's heart inflammation was mild and did not pose a significant risk of cardiac death. In addition, a forensic pathology expert testified that there was no evidence of myocarditis, calling into question the initial cause of death determination. Instead, the experts hypothesized that drowning was the cause of death, citing five key points. First, during CPR, Michelle regurgitated large amounts of water, indicating that she had swallowed it. Second, water was found in Michelle's airway, indicating that she had inhaled a large amount of water. Third, Michelle's lungs weighed twice as much as typical lungs. The fourth, fluid was discovered in Michelle's lung chambers. Fifth, Michelle's blood demonstrated a significant dilution of the phenomenon associated with inhaling water, which then enters blood vessels and circulates throughout the body. During the trial, the prosecution presented testimony from five jailhouse informants, one of whom claimed to have seen a television show about Martin while in prison and informed him about it initially hesitant to go into detail. According to the inmate, Martin later admitted to giving Michelle sleeping pills and oxycodone. He then allegedly admitted to placing her in the bathtub and holding her head underwater for a short period of time. Another inmate inquired about Michelle's fate, to which Martin allegedly replied that the bitch drowned. The remaining inmates testified that Martin brags about his ability to avoid detection and expresses confidence that authorities will never be able to prove his crimes. The defense claimed that Michelle's death was due to natural causes. Pointing out the various medical examiners involved in the case, none of them could definitively conclude that Michelle's death was the result of homicide. 
The defense claimed Michelle had a heart attack, causing her to fall headfirst into the bathtub. The autopsy revealed an enlarged heart, narrowing of the heart arteries and evidence of liver and kidney deterioration. Despite the defense's argument, more than six years after Michelle's death on September 19, 2014, McNeil was sentenced to a minimum of 15 years to life in prison for first-degree murder, plus an additional term of 1 to 15 years for obstruction of justice. In contrast, Gypsy was not charged with murder. While some members of Michelle's family suspected her involvement, Gypsy insisted that she had no knowledge of any plans to harm Michelle. Martin appealed his conviction, and finally, McNeil, 61, committed suicide in prison on April 9, 2017. He is now two and a half years into his sentence. He was discovered dead in an outside yard near the prison's greenhouse. According to a report from the Unified Police Department, McNeil killed himself with a hose and a natural gas line that served as fuel for a greenhouse heater. Michelle's case could have been closed if her family had not been so persistent. Despite the challenges of reopening the case, they refused to give up until the truth was revealed. The family suspected foul play after Michelle's death, believing Martin had murdered her. Timothy Wilson Spencer, also known as the Southside Strangler, was a serial killer who committed a series of brutal rapes and murders in Virginia during the 1980s. His crime spree was particularly notable because it led to the first conviction in the United States based on DNA evidence, marking a significant milestone in forensic science and criminal justice. Spencer's crimes left a profound impact on the communities he terrorized and highlighted the importance of DNA evidence in solving violent crimes. Born on July 15, 1952, in Lynchburg, Virginia, Debbie and Dudley Davis had a brief marriage after school that ended in divorce. Then she followed her cousin Judy Fisk to Richmond, Virginia, and moved into an apartment on Devonshire Street in the Westover Hills neighborhood. Debbie started working as Style Weekly's accounts manager in 1985. They are a media outlet based in Richmond. Debbie was a pop culture fan who enjoyed Bruce Springsteen records. She was an extra in the HBO movie, Finnegan Begin Again. Debbie was an avid mystery novel reader. She worked a couple nights a week at the Walden Bookstore at Cloverleaf Mall in Chesterfield County. On the evening of September 18, 1987, Debbie and her coworker Deanna Huff took a road trip to Virginia Beach. They went to see a performance by Dana Carvey. After the show, Deanna dropped Debbie at her apartment and waited to drive off until she was safely inside. Little did Deanna know this would be the last time she ever saw Debbie again. The next morning, a man named Arnold Ellis saw a Renault Alliance parked in front of his house. He noticed the motor was running. The keys were in the ignition, and there was no sign of the car's driver. Arnold Ellis then called the police. Police officers determined that the car belonged to Debbie Davis. She lived one street over from Arnold Ellis. A police officer knocked on Debbie's door, but got no response. An elderly neighbor then came to give the officer a key. Inside, the officer saw Debbie's body face down on her bed. She was topless, wearing only a pair of cut-off jean shorts. Her right arm was tied behind her back with thick boot laces. Debbie's left arm was tied beneath her. The perpetrator tightly twisted a black sock around her neck. She had been strangled and assaulted. Investigators discovered that the perpetrator stole a rocking chair from a nearby porch and propped it up outside Debbie's kitchen window to gain entrance. Next to Debbie's bed on her nightstand was a mystery novel she had been reading, called Presumed Innocent. It was about a woman who was tied up and then her life was taken. Investigators knew the perpetrator was smart and most likely experienced. He left no fingerprints. There were no witnesses, and nothing had been taken as far as investigators could tell. Detective Ray Williams said, Very seldom does a crook do that kind of damage and spend that much time with his victim and not leave a bunch of clues, but he left nothing. Lorna Wickoff, the founder of Style Weekly, 
posted a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Investigators looked at people in Debbie's life to see if anyone stood out, but found nothing. Debbie led a quiet life. Debbie was not dating anyone, she had not seen her ex-husband in years, and she did not use drugs and did not hang out in bars. Just two weeks after Debbie's life was ended, tragedy would strike again in Richmond, Virginia. Susan Elizabeth Hellams was born on February 6, 1955 in Charleston, South Carolina. She moved to Richmond, Virginia, to work on a residency in neurosurgery at the Medical College of Virginia. Susan married Marcel Slag and bought a house in the tranquil Woodland Heights neighborhood in Richmond. On October 3, 1987, Marcel pulled up to their house at 1.45 a.m. As he entered the house, he could hear her moving around upstairs. Marcel knew she had worked late and thought he might have woken her up. He quickly took a shower and silently crept into their dark bedroom. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness, he could make out a sight from a horror movie. His wife's partially nude body laying half out of their bedroom closet. A red leather belt was around her neck. Susan's hands had been bound tightly behind her back with an extension cord and necktie. Just like Debbie, Susan had been assaulted and strangled. Marcel saw their bedroom window was wide open. Their house was a little less than a mile away from Debbie Davis's house. Detective Ray Williams was on duty that night and was ordered to work both cases. Williams said that the perpetrator was still in the house when Marcel arrived home. He heard somebody upstairs. It couldn't have been Susan. She was already gone. On the balcony outside the window, investigators found an open Vaseline jar left by the perpetrator. They traced its purchase to a store adjacent to nearby Cloverleaf Mall. The lead was followed but led to nowhere. Realizing a serial offender is in their midst, the community erupted into fear. They demanded action from the police. Williams worked tirelessly for days and finally, he did find a clue that could potentially be useful. When he looked through the financial records at the Cloverleaf Mall Walden bookstore, where Debbie worked part-time, he found a check written by Susan and endorsed on the back by Debbie. Williams wasn't sure if this was just a coincidence, or if it was a possible link between the two crimes. As Detective Williams pondered this question, yet another horrendous crime took place in the Richmond area. Diane Cho was born in Korea in 1972. She and her family immigrated to the United States in 1984. On 1987, 15-year-old Diane was a freshman at Manchester High School. She was very smart and took care of virtually everything for her parents, who barely spoke English. In October of 1987, Diane told one of her friends about a disturbing, recurring nightmare she had been having. Diane kept having dreams about an unknown man following her. She also told her friends at school that she sometimes saw this unknown man from her dreams at the mall. One night in November of 1987, Diane went to the Cloverleaf Mall Theater with a friend. They bought tickets for the Princess Bride. She then began trembling with fright and pointed out her stalker, who was staring at them from the parking lot. It had been barely five months since Diane's family moved to Richmond, where her parents worked long hours running a convenience store near Virginia Commonwealth University. It's not known if Diane ever told her parents about the encounter with the unknown man at the Cloverleaf Mall. On the night of November 21st of 1987, Diane's parents arrived home to their apartment around 9. Diane's mother then gave her a haircut. As they went to bed around midnight, they could hear Diane typing out an English paper in her bedroom across the hall. The next day, Diane's parents called home around 2 p.m. to remind their children to get ready for an afternoon church service. Diane's 12-year-old brother, Roman, answered the phone. Diane was still asleep and he did not want to anger her by waking her up. Diane's parents arrived home about an hour later and her mother went straight to Diane's bedroom and opened the door. Diane's mom then screamed loudly. Diane was tied up with rope, she had been strangled and assaulted, and her bedroom window was open. You can clearly see the pattern of all the crimes. It would happen again for the fourth time.
44-year-old Sue Tucker lived in Arlington County, Virginia in November of 1987. She was an editor for a Department of Agriculture magazine. Her husband, Reg Tucker, was a former photographer for the Fairfax County Public Schools. Reg had taken a job as a photography teacher in his native country of Wales in early 1987. Sue was preparing the couple's home for sale and winding down her projects at work as she planned to join her husband in Wales. Ironically, they wanted to immigrate because of an increase in violence in the United States. They were worried about crime. A neighbor of the couple, Audrey C. Slove, had been unable to reach Sue for a few days and noticed that Sue's bedroom window had been open for days. When Audrey tried to enter their home to check on her friend, she smelled an odor like rotting flesh. She called the police, who arrived and found Sue's badly decomposing body laid out across her bed. She had been tightly bound in nylon ropes, strangled, and assaulted. There were no fingerprints. The perpetrator had broken in through a small basement laundry room window. Before leaving, he had taken the time to fix a snack. He discarded a partially eaten orange on the Tucker's dining room table. While investigators were inside the house, the telephone rang. It was Reg Tucker. The last few days he had been trying to reach Sue. Police officers had to give him the horrible news. Arlington investigators who were assigned to the case realized the crime was very similar to the one that took place in January of 1984. 32-year-old attorney Carolyn Ham was slain. Her body had been found not far from Sue Tucker's home. David Vasquez, a fast food worker with a low IQ, had confessed to that crime and was serving a 35-year prison sentence for it. If he was in prison, why were there identical crimes being committed almost four years later? Arlington County Detective Joe Horgies was the lead investigator on Sue Tucker's case. He traveled to the prison to interview David Vasquez because the modus operandi was the same. The hands tied behind the back, rope around the neck, and they were both assaulted. After the interview, it was clear to the detective that Vasquez was not at all involved with what happened to Sue. As investigators in both Arlington County and Richmond investigated their cases, they noticed something. Just like Richmond had a serial offender attacking women in their homes in 1987, Arlington County had their own maniac in 1983 and 1984. It all started in Arlington in June of 1983 with the abduction and assault of a woman in the county's Green Valley area by a knife-wielding black man in his late teens or early twenties wearing a homemade mask. Over the next seven months, as his attacks escalated, he abducted women in their cars and entered their houses and apartments through unlocked windows. He relentlessly assaulted and brutalized nine women. He tied some of them up with nylon cords cut from their Venetian blinds. Former Arlington County Commonwealth's attorney, Halen Fahey, was quoted as saying, he was a one-person crime wave. In January of 1984, an Arlington woman came home to discover evidence from an unsettling break-in. The cords of her Venetian blinds had been cut and were laid out on her bed. The intruder left the house. It seemed like he was there waiting for her to come home and got tired of waiting. It was four days after that that Caroline Ham was found bound and strangled in her garage. Arlington police arrested David Vasquez and charged him with taking her life. Vasquez did not match the description that any of the assault victims gave, but the crimes in the area did stop. It was only after Sue Tucker's slaying that investigators learned the perpetrator of all the assaults was definitely not Vasquez and the unknown man took a brief hiatus and then continued his attacks in Richmond. Detective Horges received a teletype from Richmond police where they described the identical strangulations of Debbie Davis, Susan Helms, and Diane Cho. After sharing all the information, investigators concluded it was the same man responsible for all the crimes, perhaps even Caroline Ham's slaying. The investigation stalled for another few agonizing weeks while they hoped for a break in the case before the strangler could take another life. Investigators looked at the timeline of the crimes. Many of them took place in 1983 to 1984 and then continued in 1987. The FBI felt that the perpetrator would not have stopped his attacks of his own volition. It was likely that he had been jailed for another offense between the slayings of Caroline Ham and Debbie Davis. 
As detectives tried to think about possible suspects, one of them thought of Tommy Spencer. He was a teenager that was arrested for burglary during the mid-1970s. Investigators discovered that Spencer had been arrested in January of 1984 for break-ins in neighboring Alexandria. He had been paroled to a halfway house in Richmond in 1987, right before Debbie's life was taken. Investigators went to the halfway house. They found that Spencer signed himself out on every evening a crime took place. He got a furlough to go to Arlington on the day that Sue Tucker's life was taken. Investigators decided to put Spencer under surveillance. They wanted to catch him in the act of doing something incriminating. Over two weeks, plainclothes Richmond police officers observed Spencer committing parole violations like spending the night at his girlfriend's house. They were intrigued to find that he would hang out for hours at Cloverleaf Mall. As you remember, the mall had strong ties to Debbie Davis, Susan Hellams, and Diane Cho. On January 20th of 1988, Arlington and Richmond detectives took Spencer into custody and took a sample of his blood. Without witnesses or fingerprints, or any other direct evidence tying Spencer to the crimes, law enforcement had to rely on a brand new forensic science method called DNA fingerprinting. At that stage, it has only been used in one cold case in the United Kingdom, and never before in the United States. It was the case of Linda Mann and Don Ashworth. It would take more than six weeks, but a private lab in New York would report back that Spencer's DNA had been matched to male DNA at the crime scenes of Debbie Davis, Dr. Susan Hellams, Susan Tucker, and assault victims in Arlington and Richmond. Timothy Spencer was the man who had become known as the Southside Strangler. He went to trial in July of 1988. After a six-day trial, he was found guilty. It was the first conviction based on DNA evidence in the United States. Spencer was given multiple life sentences. After DNA linked Timothy Spencer to all the other crimes, investigators were seriously doubting that David Vasquez was involved. DNA soon proved it as well, and Vasquez was released. David Vasquez became known as the first person in the United States that was exonerated thanks to DNA. Shortly before 11 p.m. on Wednesday, April 27, 1994, Timothy Wilson Spencer was strapped into Virginia's sturdy oak and electric chair dubbed Old Sparky at Greensville Correctional Center, and was executed, finally bringing a stop to the horrendous crime spree. The murder case of Sarah Rodriguez is a tragic story of domestic violence that ended in murder. Sarah Rodriguez was killed by her ex-boyfriend, Richard Namey, in Orange County, California. On the day of the murder, Naimi ambushed Sarah and her friend Matt Corbett while they were sitting in a car. Naimi shot Sarah and Matt with a revolver, killing Sarah instantly and critically injuring Matt. Matt survived but was left partially blind and paralyzed. Police eventually apprehended him after a high-speed chase. He was found guilty of Sarah's murder and sentenced to 101 years to life in prison. Sarah Rodriguez was born in 1982 and lived in Placentia, California. Like its name indicates, Placentia was a pleasant and safe place to live. Its neighborhoods were very family-friendly, and the crime rate was especially low compared to other areas in the county. There, Sarah grew up surrounded by her family, who remember her as a very approachable and funny person with a great heart. Helping others was in her nature, so when she graduated high school, Nobody was surprised when she pursued a career in child development. She was attending college and working as a preschool teacher on the side. Sarah came from a religious family, and her faith was a big part of her daily life. Whoever spent time with her had to understand how important this aspect of her life was, and her boyfriend, Matt Corbett, understood and shared this devotion with her. Matt was only a few months younger than Sarah, and since high school, the two had been dating. Despite taking a break for a few months in 2002, they were back together in 2003 and stronger than ever. Matt and Sarah understood and respected each other, and Sarah's family were convinced that the two were heading towards a beautiful life together. Sadly, their time together would reach an abrupt ending in April of 2003, when tragedy struck Sarah and Matt. On April 16th of 2003, 
Sarah picked Matt up in her car. That evening they had Bible study. But before heading over there, they decided to pick up some takeout from a local restaurant and have it at home. On their way back from the restaurant, at around 5 p.m., a black Nissan cut them off on the road. Someone exited the car and went straight for the driver's side where Sarah was sitting. He pulled out a gun and shot her straight in the head. Immediately, and before Matt could get out of the car, the killer ran to the passenger's side and shot Matt multiple times, both on his body and his head. Then, the mysterious gunman drove away. It was the middle of the afternoon in April, and of course many neighbors heard the commotion and the shots. When looking out the window, they saw Sarah's car and two people sitting motionless inside. They immediately called 911 and emergency services made their way to Hill Street, which was now pronounced a crime scene. Although emergency services arrived very quickly after the neighbors called them, Sarah was already dead. She'd sustained one single shot to the head, but that had been enough to take her life. Matt, on the other hand, was still alive. Despite having received several shots, he was still breathing and was rushed to the hospital. He was in critical condition and odds weren't playing in his favor, but he was still alive. The crime scene delivered little to no clues about what happened. There were no fingerprints recovered from the car, suggesting whoever shot the couple either wore gloves or barely touched the doors or the inside. No bullet casings were found either. Since the gunman had escaped so quickly, it was unlikely that he'd stop to pick them up, so investigators thought the murder weapon could have been a revolver and left no casings behind. Neighbors were interviewed and confirmed that the car that cut Sarah and Matt off was a black Nissan. They weren't able to identify the killer, other than the fact that it was a man, but nobody recognized or was able to give a description. The more they looked into what little evidence they had, the more investigators believed this was a crime of passion. It was the middle of the day, on a quiet suburban street. Nothing was stolen and the car had deliberately cut them off to shoot them. Everything pointed at a targeted attack against Sarah and Matt. Police began questioning the coupled circle, starting with one of Sarah's friends who was actually at the crime scene. When police taped off the crime scene, a young man seemed to be trying to get a closer look. It turns out it was a friend of Sarah's who was in the neighborhood and recognized her car. Police asked him questions right there on the spot and after a few conversations, he mentioned a young man Sarah had been having trouble with an ex-boyfriend who'd been bothering her for months. Sarah's family confirmed this information and also mentioned an ex-boyfriend of Sarah's. His name was Richard Namey. 26-year-old Richard Namey was also a local to Placentia. It's not clear how they met, but it's suspected it was mutual friends who introduced them. Sarah and Richard didn't date for long, just around eight months, but when she ended things with him, he didn't take it well. He became violent towards her, threatened her, and even physically assaulted her. Things only got worse when he found out that Sarah and Matt were back together. Richard would follow Sarah when she was going to class or coming home from work. He would say things to her from his car and he constantly told her she was making a mistake. Sarah kept a personal journal which investigators were able to access. In this journal, she talked about Richard and all the terrible things that happened during their relationship. He threw things at her, threatened her if she pressed charges and he told her she'd better not get a restraining order since he was in probation and could be sent back to jail. If that happened, he'd sworn to kill her. Sarah detailed all of these accounts in her personal journal, but she never shared them with her family. As with many other cases of domestic violence, the victim often hides behind a feeling of shame and fear. All she wished for was for him to leave her alone and let her live her life in peace. Despite Richard's threats, investigators found that on April 1st, just two weeks before she was shot to death, Sarah had filed a restraining order to keep Richard away from her. She'd done exactly what he told her not to do, and considering the outcome, it started to look like Richard had gone through with his threats. As soon as investigators learned this information, they tried to contact him, but he was nowhere to be found. Nobody was answering the door at his apartment and police began looking for him at the places he was usually found. He was definitely a person of interest. However, there was still a big problem. There was no way of connecting him to the crime scene, 
since the car registered in his name at the DMV was a blue Chevrolet El Camino, and not a black Nissan like the one at the crime scene. While investigators try and locate Richard to question him, Matt Corbett regained consciousness at the hospital. The shots he received had left him paralyzed from the waist down, and he'd lost sight out of one of his eyes. At this point, he still didn't know his girlfriend had passed, and wouldn't find out for a few weeks so as not to affect his recovery. Regardless, he was miraculously alive, and after an extensive surgery and many critical hours, he was awake and eager to speak about what happened. Police already saw Richard Namey as a person of interest, but once they were able to speak to the victim, he confirmed what they suspected. Matt identified Richard as the man who tried to kill him. Sarah's restraining order against Richard Namey wasn't his first one. Another ex-girlfriend was also threatened to death by Richard, who pointed a gun at her after finding out she'd filed a restraining order against him. Although he didn't kill her, she got so scared away after that incident that she moved as far away as she could to escape Richard's wrath. The more investigators dug into Richard's past, the more they began to know him. As well as a history of violence towards partners, Richard was also very problematic in his family. He was a drug user, he stole frequently, he had violent behavior, he had a child he wasn't involved with. Speaking to his family only confirmed suspicions that Richard was possibly behind the homicide. And then Richard's sister gave investigators the piece of evidence they needed to put him at the scene. Richard drove a blue Chevrolet, but on the day of the murder, he told his sister his car wasn't working and he needed to borrow hers. The car in question was a black Nissan, and it matched the description given by the witnesses at the scene. Police officially named Richard a suspect and released a warrant for his arrest, as well as getting a warrant to search his apartment. Inside, there was no Richard, but there were three notes addressing his family. Notes in which he apologized for what was going to happen to him and how the world would be a better place without him. It seemed that Richard Namey was going to take his own life. Police established surveillance around the county, trying to find him before he took his life or fled the state. But the search was unsuccessful, and investigators grew more and more anxious. They were very close to solving the case, but they seemed to be very far away from finding their suspect. While police were looking everywhere for Richard, a few miles away, in Santa Ana, officers were being called to a car hijacking, in which the suspect was armed. The car owner hadn't been harmed, but the suspect had sped off with their car and police began chasing him. The intense chase continued for several minutes, until the suspect got out of the car and ran into a tunnel underneath a local school. It was dark, and officers knew he was armed, but luckily, they were able to apprehend him and take him into custody. When he was arrested, he told officers, I'm going away for life. You don't understand. Police didn't understand why he thought stealing a car would send him away for life, until they asked for his ID. His name was Richard Namey, and immediately, officers recognized him as the murder suspect their neighbors in the Placentia Police Department were looking for. Richard Namey was taken into custody, and immediately confessed to shooting the gun that killed Sarah and injured Matt. The notes left saying goodbye to his family had only been a distraction to try and get away from the area before he was found. None of it was true. However, as soon as he confessed, he began blaming everything on Sarah. Painting himself as the victim, he told investigators it was her fault for treating him badly and breaking up their relationship. Even though they weren't together, he considered she was cheating on him for getting back with Matt, and he had to do something about it. The detectives who questioned Richard remember his lack of accountability for anything he'd done. He teared up talking about how much he'd gone through and how horrible Sarah had been to him, but he showed no remorse for shooting the couple. Sarah was the one who made him do what he did, and it was her fault that Matt would now be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. A year later, in 2004, Richard Namey's trial began, in which he was charged with the murder of Sarah Rodriguez and the attempted murder of Matt Corvette. Those who attended the trial said it was an incredibly emotional moment. Many of Sarah's family members and friends wore t-shirts with the couple's picture on them. And when Matt testified, the silence in the courtroom was heartbreaking. I lost the only girl I could ever really talk to, he said in a cracked voice. I just miss Sarah. 
I'd give anything to have her here. Sarah's mother also testified, and even addressed Richard, calling him an evil coward. Richard Namie's trial lasted one week, and the jury found him guilty in both charges. His total sentence was 101 years to life behind bars. A sentence he's still serving today, and will probably continue to do so for the rest of his days. But Sarah's family will never get their loved one back, and Matt will be faced with the scars of that terrible day for the rest of his life. Jason Corbett, a successful Irish businessman was murdered in 2015. He was found dead in his home in North Carolina, having suffered fatal head injuries inflicted by his wife, Molly Martins Corbett, and her father, Thomas Martins. Initially, both Molly and Thomas were convicted of second-degree murder in 2017 and sentenced to lengthy prison terms. They claimed self-defense, stating that Jason had attacked Molly and that Thomas intervened with a baseball bat to protect her. However, in 2021, the North Carolina Supreme Court ruled that errors in the original trial warranted a new trial. Jason Corbett was born on December 11, 1976, in Limerick, Ireland. He grew up in a close-knit community and eventually settled down with his first wife, Margaret Fitzpatrick, with whom he had two children, Jack and Sarah. Tragically, Margaret passed away in 2006, due to an asthma attack. Jason, left as a widower, dedicated himself to raising their two young children. Deeply grieving, he visited Margaret's grave daily, bringing flowers and sharing news about their children with her. In 2008, Jason hired Molly Martins as a nanny for his children. Over time, their relationship evolved, and they married in 2011. The family later moved to North Carolina, where Jason worked for a packaging company. Despite outward appearances of a happy family, their relationship had significant underlying tensions and issues. On August 2, 2015, at 3 a.m., Tom, Molly's father, called 911. He informed the operator, quote, My daughter's husband, my son-in-law, had gotten into an argument with my daughter. I intervened, and I believe he's in bad shape. We need assistance. He's bleeding profusely, and I may have killed him." Unquote. A paramedic team was dispatched to the scene, and the emergency dispatcher instructed Tom and Molly to perform CPR until they arrived. Unfortunately, there was nothing that could help Jason. He died of multiple blows to the head. Tom and Molly were transported to the police station in separate patrol cars. Molly described what happened that night at their house. Sarah, eight-year-old at that time, approached her in her husband's bedroom door around 3 a.m. She was experiencing nightmares again. Molly went up to her room to comfort her. When Molly returned, Jason was furious at being woken up. After that, the couple got into a fight and Jason attacked Molly and started choking her. Tom heard the screams and noises. He walked into their bedroom with a baseball bat in his hand. Tom, 65, confirmed his daughter's statement while sitting in another interview room. When he awoke to screams upstairs, he told his wife to stay in the room and decided to investigate what was happening. He heard Jason threaten to kill his daughter, so Tom brought a metal bat for protection. Tom entered the bedroom as Jason was strangling Molly. Tom turned to Jason and asked him to let his daughter go and relax. He refused to let Molly go and threatened to kill her. Jason turned his back on the bathroom and started dragging Molly behind him. She resisted, but she was weakened. Tom realized his daughter could not be left alone with the aggressor, so he hit Jason in the head several times with the bat. However, Jason was able to knock Tom to the ground and take away the bat. Molly, terrified that Jason would kill Tom, grabbed a decorative garden stolen from the bedside table and used it to cover Jason's head. Due to the pause, Tom was able to get to his feet, grab the bat, and continue to hit Jason in the head. He paused when he realized he was already dead. Tom admitted that he did not like his son-in-law and his family and had previously advised Molly to hire a lawyer and file for divorce. The police photographed Molly and Tom for the report. Surprisingly, 
There were no signs of a struggle, such as abrasions or bruises. In January 2016, Tom and Molly were charged with second-degree murder. They faced trial in July 2017 for Jason Corbett's murder. The prosecution presented a very different version of events, one that excluded strangulation and self-defense. Prosecutors relied heavily on forensic evidence, including photographs of Jason's body and gruesome signs of a struggle in the bedroom. According to the pathologist's report, Jason was struck at least 12 times in the head. The exact number could not be given because he was hit in the same spot repeatedly. The skull has visible cracks and severe bruising, similar to an injury sustained by someone who has fallen from a great height, been involved in a car accident. According to a spatter expert, Jason's head was once 30 or 45 centimeters off the floor, and he continued to be struck. According to prosecutors, Jason was struck first while still sedated in his bed. Toxicology tests confirmed that Jason's system contained a sedative prescribed in Molly's name two days prior to the tragedy. Furthermore, Jason's $600,000 insurance policy had been changed about a year ago, and Molly was now the sole beneficiary. The jury was also shown photos of the defendants taken at the station on the night of August 2nd. Tom and Molly had no scratches on them. It was impossible to engage in the fight Molly described with a man who was larger, stronger, and taller without receiving a scratch or bruise. Tom and Molly were probably delaying the 911 call, making up their story for the cops while Jason's body cooled on the floor. This thought occurred after paramedics arrived at the Corbett home and noticed his body's low temperature. It was already cold. Jason's abusive behavior was not disclosed during his trial. Domestic violence was rarely discussed during the trial. In his testimony, Tom claimed that Jason exercised a lot of control over Molly. He noticed bruises on her body but had no idea where they came from. Although he admitted that he had never witnessed Jason's physical aggression except on that August night prior to sentencing, Molly stated that incidents like August 2nd occurred on a regular basis. The only difference this time was that her father was in the house in defense of his clients. The attorney displayed a photo from the station showing Molly with a red mark on her neck, confirming strangulation. Jason had a routine physical exam two weeks prior to the incident, and the doctor stated that he had been stressed recently. He complained about uncontrollable fits of unreasonable rage. The autopsy revealed marks on Jason's left arm, indicating that he was defending himself, but none on his right arm, which he allegedly used to hold Molly by the neck. After nine days of testimony, arguments and photos from the scene of the tragedy, the jury was excused to deliberate after less than five hours in the room. They found Tom and Molly guilty. Both received sentences ranging from 20 to 25 years in prison. The court ruled a few days after the verdicts were announced. The lawyers objected to the court's decision, citing judicial errors, particularly the jury's incorrect actions, which violated the judge's instructions. Even before the verdict was announced, one of the jurors gave an interview to journalists, revealing that some of them had discussed the case in private, which is strictly prohibited. However, the court denied the motion. In Tom's case, the appeals court allowed only the defense and prosecution to present oral arguments in Mali in January 2019, but the defendants were not present. Each side was given only half an hour to present their main arguments. On February 4th, 2020, the North Carolina Court of Appeals overturned Tom and Molly's convictions and ordered a new trial. Among other errors in the first trial, evidence that Jason was violent toward Molly was excluded. A year later, the North Carolina Supreme Court upheld the appellate court's decision, despite the state's challenge. It determined that the exclusion of certain evidence at trial, as well as the erroneous inclusion of others, may have prevented Tom and Molly from presenting a compelling defense, and thus their claims of self-defense had little evidentiary support. As a result, the jury was not fully informed about the evidence, and they were unable to perform their constitutional duties. Molly and Tom were each released on $200,000 bail in April 2021, after serving 44 months in prison. The interviews given by two young children shortly after their father's death are particularly noteworthy, and while in the custody of Molly's family, both Jack and Sarah have since recanted their statements. 
They claimed that they were coached to lie about domestic abuse. They have since informed the Davidson County District Attorney's Office from their residence in Ireland that Molly coerced them into making those false statements, and that Molly was the one who was abusive. A new trial was held in November 2023, and the judge sentenced Molly Martins and her father Thomas to prison for at least seven months following an emotional final day of sentencing hearings. Molly Martins and her father Thomas were let out of a North Carolina court in handcuffs after receiving sentences ranging from 7 to 30 months for Jason Corbett's voluntary manslaughter. This is in addition to the three and a half years Molly and Thomas have already served since being convicted of murder. Molly Martins and her father walked free from prison Thursday, June 6, 2024, the last chapter in a murder drama that spawned heartache on both sides of the ocean. In a statement, Jason Corbett's daughter Sarah said that she is disappointed that Molly Martins Corbett and Thomas Martins are being released. The sentence disappoints me. I'm doing the best I can but I feel let down and disappointed by any outcome where the Martins are released back into society. It feels unjust that they weren't brought before a jury of their peers. I am confident they would have been found guilty, evident by their acceptance of the plea deal. On November 15, 2004, Peter Porco, a 52-year-old man, was found dead of massive head injuries in his home in Del Mar, New York. His wife, Joan Porco, was discovered lying in the bed with severe head trauma. Miraculously, she survived the attack, she was clinging on to life when investigators and medics arrived at the crime scene hours later, but lost one eye and part of her skull and suffered severe facial disfigurement. Setting in motion an intensive 21-month investigation and the most widely followed murder case on record in this region, the perpetrator was finally identified. This is the case of Peter Porco's murder. Peter and Joan Porco lived in Del Mar, New York. Peter was 52 years old and an Appalachian Division Court clerk, while his wife Joan was a children's speech pathologist. The pair had been married for 30 years and together they had two sons, Christopher, 21, and his older brother Jonathan, 23. Jonathan was serving in the U.S. Navy, where at the time he was stationed on a U.S. nuclear submarine. Christopher, on the other hand, was attending the University of Rochester, about a three hours drive from the Porco's home, where he studied biomedical engineering and economics. On the 15th of November, 2004, Peter got out of bed and carried out his regular morning routine. He went to the bathroom and brushed his teeth, got dressed, went downstairs and put the coffee maker on and loaded the dishwasher. Afterwards, he went back inside to continue getting ready for work. However, when he failed to show, his colleagues immediately knew something was wrong, as it was unlike Peter not to come to work without calling in to explain. Concerned for his well-being, one of Peter's colleagues, Michael Hart, stopped by the Porco's home on Broccoli Drive to make sure everything was okay. It wouldn't take long for Michael to realize that something was terribly wrong, when upon arriving, he had noticed a key in the lock of the front door. Placing his head against the front door glass, he was horrified to see Peter's lifeless body sprawled across the floor. There, he laid in a large pool of blood. Michael would immediately contact the police, who had arrived soon after the call was made. Officers arrived and used the spare key still in the lock to gain entry. Inside, they began searching the premises. As they searched, they noticed blood all over the home. Peter had sustained a vicious attack to his head, and there was a blood trail leading from where he was to the kitchen, upstairs, and to his bedroom. The police followed the trail, where it led them to Peter's room. There, they found Peter's wife, Joan, with similar injuries to her head, and a fireman axe that the pair owned, laying on the bed beside her. As they got closer to Joan, they saw the extent of her wounds. Part of her brain was exposed, and she had lost one of her eyes, and her jaw was smashed to pieces. But to the amazement of the police, Joan was still alive. Paramedics were called, but before she was taken away, Detective Christopher Bodish asked her questions about the events which took place. He wasn't sure if she would survive, and so wanted to take the opportunity while he had the chance. Joan, understandably, was unable to speak, but she was able to answer the questions with a series of nods and head shakes. 
Joan was able to tell Detective Bodish that it was a family member who attacked her. When he asked if it was Jonathan, Joan shook her head. When he asked if it was Christopher, in the presence of the paramedics there, Joan nodded her head. Yes. Immediately, Bodish had Christopher Porco listed as his prime suspect, and got to work trying to locate him. However, Christopher would be the one who would get in touch with the police, after he learned of his parents' attack, after receiving a call from a journalist at Times Union, searching for a comment. Christopher explained to police that he hadn't left Rochester University, at the time his parents were found. Not only this, but Rochester University was 200 miles away from the Porco home. An investigation on the home found no signs of forced entry, and there was no sign that a burglary had taken place. The phone line to the home had been cut, and a fingerprint was recovered just inches where the line had been severed. However, apart from this, there were no other forensic signs that another person was in the home. The police saw that the home alarm system, which had been destroyed, but the box, which recorded entries into the alarm system, which was kept in the basement, was untouched. Police learned that around 2.14 a.m., the alarm system was turned off from within the home, using the master code. As for the murder weapon, the fireman axe belonged to the Porcos, and it was thought to have been picked up in the garage and taken upstairs by the killer. In terms of the injuries sustained, Peter bore the brunt of the attack, sustaining 16 axe wounds to the face and head. Joan would only be hit three times. Peter had survived much longer than anyone would have imagined. After he was attacked, Peter would have lost consciousness. After coming round, he would have been in such a state of shock that he didn't realize that he had been victim to such a brutal attack. He then began to carry out his morning routine. Blissfully unaware, he had sustained a staggering 16 axe wounds to the head before succumbing to his injuries, dying due to substantial blood loss. Joan in the meantime had been rushed to hospital where she would undergo surgery for 12 hours. For Joan, medical officials were still unsure whether she would pull through, but she would defy all odds, surviving her ordeal. Jonathan would learn of his parents' fate and rush to Bethlehem Hospital to be with his mother, along with Christopher. While Christopher was firmly on the police radar, they had to figure out how he could have carried out the attack on his parents. Not only this, but there were also other potential suspects they had to consider, as well as Christopher. There was a man who had been left angry after being unsuccessful in a custody battle that Peter Porco was working on, and he vowed to take revenge on Peter. However, when police interviewed this unnamed man, he was found to have a rock-solid alibi. The next potential lead came from a man named Frank Porco, also known as Frankie the Fireman. Frank was Peter's great-uncle, and he was a lone shark who had connections to the mob, suspecting that Frank may be about to rat on them. They could have killed Peter and injured Joan, using the fireman axe in a sick attempt to send out a message to Frank, but this was also ruled out after it merged Frank, who was in prison at the time, was behind bars for refusing to cooperate with police, causing this theory to break down. Turning their attention back to Christopher, they began to dig into his past, and it wouldn't take long for a pattern of behavior to emerge, which would draw further suspicion. While Peter and Joan were by no means paupers, they were reasonably comfortable financially. Although Christopher would exaggerate his family's wealth, claiming to come from an extremely wealthy background, friends of Christopher would say his family owned several real estate holdings, as well as many vacation homes. In reality, they owned none. Christopher, while happy to brag about his so-called wealth, would be considered very private to those who knew him, and would often deny requests to see the properties, offering up varying excuses as to why they couldn't go with him to see these homes. Detective Bodish also learned of tensions within the Porco family. It was established that the robberies that the family had suffered in the years prior were actually carried out by Christopher himself. Christopher would then develop an eBay scam, where he would list the stolen items online, where unsuspecting buyers would part money in exchange for these goods, only to never receive these items. When these customers would email to complain that items hadn't been shipped, Christopher would then pretend to be his brother Jonathan, where he would tell them that Christopher had died, and that there was nothing he could possibly do. Jonathan and Christopher shared the same eBay account, 
and Jonathan could see what his brother was doing, worried about how Christopher's behavior may impact his Navy career. He would attempt to reach out to Christopher on several occasions for an explanation, only to receive the cold shoulder each time. He would also steal property from his own roommates, after it emerged a laptop that went missing appeared on Christopher's eBay account. Police would dig deeper into Christopher's history, and find even more areas of concern. In the years building up to the murder, tensions had grown between Christopher and his parents. They discovered that Christopher had taken out a loan, primarily to cover the cost of his tuition fees at Rochester University, but instead he used this money to purchase a yellow Jeep Wrangler. Christopher was also struggling with his grades, ultimately leading to the university suspending him. He would enroll into a nearby community college, but he would only continue to struggle. While he was traveling with friends around Europe, his parents learned of his struggling grades and confronted him about them. Forging transcripts from the community college, Christopher was able to get himself back into Rochester University by late 2004. He explained to his parents that he was able to be readmitted as his professor mislaid his final exam paper, which he had taken the previous year. He went on to tell them that because of the error on the university's part, they would be covering his tuition fees. In reality, Christopher had taken out a line of credit, forging his father's signature, as well as forging his signature again on loan documents as a co-signatory. These loans would go towards paying for his Wrangler. His parents would learn of their son's activities around two weeks before the attack. Peter would be notified that a loan Christopher had taken out was delinquent. And not only this, he was aware that his son was now forging his signature. He had also learned that Christopher forged his signature on the line of credit that he had also taken out. And to add insult to injury, he would even learn that Christopher's tuition fees weren't being covered by the university. Peter and Joan made numerous attempts to contact Christopher by phone, to no success. He would eventually email Christopher, telling him that if he continued to forge his signature, he would have no choice but to file forgery affidavits with the bank. Despite Christopher's behavior, Peter and Joan made it clear that their son was still welcoming the family home, and told them that while they were disappointed with his actions, they still loved him and cared for his future. It was also discovered about a week prior to Peter's murder and Joan's brutal assault, that Christopher had visited a financial advisor, looking for advice, telling the professional that he was coming into some money. Christopher, by the age of 21, had racked up almost $50,000 worth of debt. Police believed that instead of working his way out of this debt, he would try and get his hands on his parents' life insurance, which was worth $1 million. Police then got to work trying to deconstruct Christopher's alibi. They visited the university and got to work speaking to students and teachers there. They learned from some of the students, who happened to be up late that night, that when they visited the dormitory at about 3 a.m., Peter wasn't there sleeping on the sofa. They obtained the university CCTV and looked for any signs of Christopher. At 10.30 p.m., they would strike gold. A yellow Jeep, which resembled Christopher's Wrangler, was seen leaving the campus, and was spotted again six minutes later off campus. They then visited the toll booths, which Christopher would have needed to use if he was heading to his parents. Two attendants told police that on the night, they recalled a yellow Jeep passing through the cash-only lanes that night. The Jeep would then be seen returning to campus at 8.30 a.m. that morning. Police knew that this would give Christopher plenty of time to commit the crime. Crucially, a neighbor recalled seeing Christopher's car outside the Porco's home at around 4 a.m., but didn't think anything of it at the time, assuming it was just Christopher staying over. Police theorized that on the night, he left campus to head to his parents' home. He arrived there, where he would use the spare key to enter the home, where he then deactivated the home alarm at 2.14 a.m. He would then collect the fireman's axe from the garage to give the impression that this was a mob-related hit. After committing the attack, he cut a hole in the window to make it look like a burglary, before smashing the alarm box and cutting the phone wire at about 4.59 a.m. He would then clean up before heading back to Rochester University. While the police were putting this together, they would receive a shocking twist, when it emerged Joan had regained consciousness. Joan, who had previously pointed the finger at her son for carrying out this attack, 
now claimed that she had no memory of these events, and that she didn't recall Bodish's questions, or saying Christopher was responsible. In fact, she firmly believed that her son was innocent. When Christopher Porco was arrested in 2005, he denied any wrongdoing. His mother fully believed him, and helped finance his bail, along with several other family members. Christopher changed his story slightly, saying that rather than sleeping on the sofa all night, he moved his jeep to Parkatov campus. He then walked around until 3 a.m. before returning home. The thing that you have to remember about this case, was that there was absolutely no forensic evidence available. As a matter of fact, the fingerprint that police found near the severed wire didn't match Christopher's prints, further cementing Joan's belief that her son was innocent, and that the police were bungling the investigation. In July 2006, Christopher Porco's trial would begin. His mother would attend alongside her son, and support him throughout the trial, remaining by his side. The prosecution argued that while there was no DNA evidence found at the scene, this was because Christopher had been working as a veterinarian, and as such, learned how to efficiently clean up forensic evidence. They also argued that he had the time, opportunity, and motive to commit the murder of his father, and attempted murder of his mother. They explained that while they couldn't identify the plates on the yellow Wrangler Jeep caught on CCTV, there were defining markings such as a mud patch, which matched the mud patch found on Chris' Jeep. Christopher's brother Jonathan would also take the stand, telling the court that their relationship was strained. Christopher's own frat brothers also testified that Christopher wasn't sleeping in the dorm at the time he claimed he was there. His defense would argue that it wasn't Christopher who would use the spare key to gain access to the home, but rather Peter, explaining that he must have used the key while he was in autopilot. Furthermore, the owners of the veterinarians testified that Christopher was a kind man, who they believed was incapable of such a heinous crime. This was because Christopher lived with them for a short time. His mother also took the stand and defended her son, repeating that she couldn't recall nodding to Bodish, and again protesting her son's innocence. The jury were sent to determine Christopher Porco's fate, and when they returned, they returned with a guilty verdict. Christopher Porco was convicted on one count of second-degree murder, and one count of attempted murder. He was sentenced to 50 years to life imprisonment, where he's currently residing at Clinton Correction Facility in Danny Mora, New York. The jury told Joan that the claim she nodded to Bodish was not a factor in their decision-making, possibly offering some assurances that she hadn't condemned her own child. To this day, Christopher's mother believes her son is innocent, and is still fighting to clear his name. If you found this helpful, please click the thumbs up button and subscribe to catch more videos. You may also leave any questions or suggestions you'd like to see me cover in future videos in the comments section.